But it's more about money for me, it's about money, 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 money. I want to earn money and do well and go on. As you see this lot, they just try to take a liberty with me and I'm going to even it up now. I pulled a can of CS gas out. I said, you better fuck off. He's going to go off now. And he knew, because he knew me. He walked off and I run at them, not spraying it at them. <laughs> and then it's controlled, you're contained. You think, God, oh, you can't do that. You can't go out for a walk in the field. You can't go and play tennis. You can't go down the road and have a pub. You can't do none of that. You are just locked in, thinking that your bird's out there getting shagged by someone. Yep. And he walked into someone's house with a chainsaw, a nice house in a really rich area, revving it up, saying, I'm going to cut all your furniture up and you. Unless you pay me monthly. I'm now your partner. He says, I'm going to stab you. I thought, you ain't stabbing me in the back. So I said, listen, mate, you are not stabbing me in the back. Make that quite clear now. I turned around, walked up to him, and went, crack. He was unconscious on his feet. Crack with a left hook as well, second one. He was unconscious for minutes on the floor. And I leant over him, and he's asleep. And all the screws were standing there like that around me. Didn't wrap me up when I think. I said, no one can ever say I've ever told him anything. <laughs> <laughs> Information covered up, censorship, oh. corruption. The mainstream media have proven itself to be untrustworthy. I'm here to give a platform for debate, for truth, for open discussion. I'm introducing you to my podcast, Silenced with Tommy Robinson. Who exactly is Tommy Robinson or Stephen Getsley Lane? With the English Defence League. Yeah. The problem is with Islamic radio. English far right Islamophobic activism. Since then, there's been organised protests across the country in London, Manchester, Leeds. People in their thousands are marching for what is There is no such thing in this country as a Muslim free Tommy Robinson. Kevin Lane claims he was wrongfully convicted of Bob McGill's murder in 1994. He was released from prison in January 2015 after having spent 18 years of a life sentence behind bars and later that year he lost an appeal challenging the safety of the murder conviction at the Court of Appeal in London. Now free, Lane insists he was set up for the crime and in 2021 published his book Fitted Up and Fighting Back in which he contested the evidence used in his conviction. He has always believed there was a conspiracy. Almost three decades, he has been working tirelessly every day to prove his innocence. I'm happy to have him now tell his story as a guest on my podcast. Welcome to my latest edition of Silence, my podcast. What do I talk about a lot? Corruption, police corruption. I sometimes sit there and feel sorry for myself because I've spent a few months behind the door for a crime I didn't commit. Then I come across a gentleman's story, Kevin Lane, who spent half his life behind the door for a crime that he says he didn't commit, with plenty of evidence of corruption. So my next guest is Kevin Lane. Kevin. Tommy, thanks to meet you. Man. Pleasure for having me on here. Well, oh, thank you for having me on here, shall I say. I was shocked reading through your story, yeah? But can we just start this? So you were, you were convicted of a murder? Yeah. Yeah? In what year? I was convicted in murder in 1996. I was arrested in January 1995. Convicted in March 96 um, and reminded for the murder of Robert McGill and this who was shot in Rickmansworth whilst walking his dog. At 8.20 in the morning, wasn't it? Something like that, yeah. And how long did, how long did you spend in jail? I was 24 in total. I served 20 years in one go from start to finish. Then we released and I've been recalled twice. And you've maintained your innocence Throughout. Throughout. But not just me maintaining my innocence, Tommy. I've had police officers been interviewed by Duncan Campbell, serving and non-serving. Both said that I was innocent and they've seen statements that were written out by the corrupt police officer in my case, naming me for the murder. But he wrote them out in, uh, in the name of one of the, the original suspects and signed it in his name. So there was two original suspects for this murder who was arrested for the murder. I can't mention... Uh, my co-defendant's name, uh, he's a supergrass. And they said I'm endangering his life by mentioning his name. But everybody knows who he is. You're I know who he is. Everybody knows Because who he is. I was shocked when I read this. I was just to get, we'll get into the full story, but I was shocked that the man that you say murdered him, or, or you allege murdered yeah, him, yeah. was then convicted for a later murder. Yeah. So if he would, if, if, if the story is true that he was the gunman, 
he wouldn't have been on the streets to kill... Kill again. To kill again. Yeah. And that was killing Dave King. And the reason why I know this story is because Dave King was the first time an AK-47 was used in Great Britain. That's and it was right. in Hoddesdon. Yeah. And Dave King was an old partner of my, one of my friends. So I knew that story at the time. I was in jail at that time. Bedford. When... The, when am I allowed to name him? Yeah. Vincent? Yeah, you can, but yeah. I can't. Okay, well, I was in jail when he got brought in. I was in jail when he got brought in. But can I just, I'll, I'll rewind first of all, just to hear your whole story, yeah? Where are you from? I'm from Harefield, Middlesex. Okay. Dad's Scottish, mum's yeah. English, dad's dead now. Died many years ago whilst I was in prison. Uh, I've got seven brothers and sisters, one brother I don't see from my dad's another marriage. So I've got uh, six that I do see and on the seventh, four sisters, and I've got three brothers. Three brothers, and did you, how was you growing up? Grew up, Skin, yeah. obviously, you say skin, knitted jumpers. I look like fucking star skin up when I went to school. You look good now, bro. Uh, I've <laughs> been bold, Tom, you know. I, know I, just, I just said to him before the cameras were rolling, he, I said, oh, You've got kids? Because I, I, read, I, I read that he had three children at the time of the, of the, uh, of the murder. I said, You've got three kids? And um, he said one of them was 36. 37, 37. and 35, and I've got a six year old. So, how old are you? 56. Don't they look good for 50? But that's prison, because uh, 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 people say you don't age. Nah, but a bit of, bit of air colouring, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> All right for Elvis, why can't I do it? <laughs> why not? Hey. You look good for 56, man. I'm shocked you're 56. Yeah, thank you. I look after myself, I train. Um, yeah, you look healthy as well. That's, is that in prison? Uh, yeah, I've always trained since I was a kid. I'd turn up at a cricket club just to get a game with the men's 12s so I could go and get fairy cake and sandwiches in half time and shitting yourself and eat a cricket ball that year. It's coming at you like a rocket. You think, fucking hell, I'm going to grab it. Just stop it and brilliantly break my hands. Yeah. So yeah, I would carry a, a golf bag around the golf course just to be involved in sport. Um, so it's been in my life, all my life. So growing up at school, when you left school, did you have problems at school? Was you a troublesome kid at school? Was you a jack and a lad? Was you a... I remember, I've always been boisterous and fun. I used to like to impersonate Frank Spencer and Norman Wisdom and do ventriloquist acts with a little doll. And I was a fun kid. But then my brother nearly got killed when he was a child and he got run over and he used to have to wear a Mr. Magoo crash helmet. So with that comes a lot of piss taking and bullying with of kids. So I remember when I was in the infants, and we used to get bottled milk then at school. Do you remember that? I remember bottled milk with a green milk. cap, yeah, yeah in the glass right. bottles, yeah. So we used to get the milk, and after we'd had the milk break, gone out to the playground, and come out of the classroom, and I've walked, come out the door, and walked around the side of the building, and my brother was there being bullied for the crash helmet. And I just steamed straight into the two fellas. They were two years older than me, and that age is quite an age difference in gap. Yeah. But it just seems to be that it's your family, it was in me of a young age. So then it just, it, it, it spirals, Tommy, and you know I understand that, because things just have a course of their own. For, you, you, for a certain action that you do, it will grow. You get a reputation, you mean? Reputation, yeah. You get a reputation that follows you. Uh, I've got that yeah. problem. You got that <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere yeah. I go. Yeah, yes. <laughs> but you had a reputation, because what I want to get, I, that's what I want to go through, is to get, for the police to be able to frame someone, or, which is where we'll get to on, on this, was there a history to, to your character that, that, made, that made it easier for them to do that? So, yeah. when, so when you left school? I got expelled from school when I was 14. I started work when I was 15. And Harefield was quite a, 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 a robust, robust, so to say. Uh, it's quite a violent village. Okay. And uh, a lot of gypsies in there at the time, travellers should I say, I don't say gypsies, it's derogatory. Yep. But we had, used to have the SPG vans in the village, two of them the popped up, yeah. 17 pubs or such in the village with a common pub calling village, and then people fighting in there. So I grew up in that atmosphere as a kid, but I didn't know who was who, Tommy, it's villains, I didn't know about the craze, I didn't know the, uh, about anybody who was anybody. All I knew about was working and birds, that's mm. all I knew. <laughs> and that served me okay <laughs> at the time of a 12 year old boy. So yeah. I'd buy him young clothes and such when I was 12 for school, different uniform, every, different clothes every day, trousers, whatever else, different watch every day, all that was snide, of course, yeah. um, at 12. Uh, for my, obviously, my mum and dad split up when I was young. My mum remarried years later, but nonetheless, I was working well before then. When I got expelled, I got flat when I was 15 with a pal of mine who was deported from America. 
is I managed to whip him with an electric lead. He went on a run for years burgling. He ended up coming to England in foster cares. He got a, f a flat. I moved in with him at 15. Okay. And then from that, I met a girl, Kim Purcell. Beautiful girl, still beautiful now. Um, mother of my eldest two children. And her family was a notorious family from West London. And I, I didn't know who they were at all. But I went to a new school. And they, I got expelled, like I say, and they went to a new school one day a week. They used to sit me in the fucking storeroom. Literally, and for, that was it. So I ended up, I was told that uh, she fancied me, so I went out of her. I fancied her mate, first of all, but then she was a better option. But she was prettier, but the other girl was a nice girl, obviously, Lorraine. But I went with Kim, and, uh, and it just, from there, worked the doors. I was on the door at 18, I looked like... Was imagine that? what I look like, can't you? 11 stone 7, baby face. Mm. People Where was you doing the doors? London. Okay. It was home counties. So I would turn up and I'd come up to someone and I'd go out to the manager. So straight away you're on a great platform because they're going to talk to you instead of get on their back foot. Yeah, yeah. And then of course if you get, got out of van, then you had to remove the customer. But... Um, the doors back then were run by lads, not like now. Yeah. Like yeah. organised. You needed a dorm and you yeah. needed them for a reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it was quite, that was problematic. But I, I started working the doors and then I bought a security company name to launch camera security. So I knew that was a way forward back in 19, well, 1988 actually, mm. 89. Um, and look where camera security is now. It's massive, isn't it? Mm. But the doors just took off. I had 12 pubs, six clubs, that's full time. Okay. 120 doormen worked for me without raves, that's without any emergency work. Yeah. Uh, and it took me off in an area that... How old were you at that point? I was 20. 20 with 120 doormen work for you? Yeah, and like flying. 24 stones and stuff like that, yeah. some of them. Yeah, flying. Flying, yeah. And, but then I was buying houses and selling houses. I bought my first house flat when I was 18. And then by the time I was 20, I was buying one a month for a while and flipping them and selling them. And, and uh, I've always known how to get money, always. You ended up in, in Tenerife, did you? When was that? Went to Tenerife in 94, split up with Kim. Okay, so before the, before the murder? Yeah. Okay. So I went out to Tenerife to get away from England. I'd had a big tear up at the Paradise Club in London. It was quite a, uh, it was quite a well known club in its day. And I'd have some dormant on started on me there. But it's quite a strange set of circumstances because there was two sets of dormant in there. Some of them were my pals and some of them had worked for me and were working for me whilst doing their own shifts there. And uh, I'd gone in there, I'd had a rave actually, I had a yard, a commercial yard, and I'd rented it out, and I kept a part of it for myself. Um, and I'd had a, Judge George, Roy DeRoach, Danny Rampling, you remember those names. Yeah. Uh, I had the rave, gone up to the Paradise Club afterwards with a friend of mine, Paul Cox, and we were sitting down having a coffee, they had a coffee bar in there. And a, do a fella come up to me with a doorman, was he two doormen? He had no, him and another doorman, that's it. And he said, give us your drugs. And I thought, what the fuck are you doing? I ain't got no drugs on me. I said, I ain't got no drugs, mate. And uh, I said, I'll tell you what, he started arguing. I said, I'll tell you what, let's take this argument outside. Because I knew there was doormen in there that I knew, out of respect for the doorman. I thought, I'm not going to have a row of in here. Mm. And of course, he's throwing a punch at me. No reason whatsoever. I said, I've got no drugs on me, mate, but let's carry on this outside. So he's throwing a punch at me. That kicked right off. Um, it'd gone right off and all, other doormen come running in from the other firm yeah. that didn't know me. Um, they were trying to get me down the stairwell where all the beer barrels go. Mm. If they'd got me down there, they'd have severely hurt me. Um, it got split up. My mate Paul Cox, I'll never forget it, Kevin, he said, you was in there just trading with them. And they're, you're tr they're in you, you're trading with them. And it got split up, like I say. And then a pal of mine, Sid McFarland, he's come into the, the scene, he's gone, Kevin, what the fuck's going on? As you see this lot, they just try to take a liberty with me, and I'm going to even it up now. And I pulled a can of CS gas out. And I said, you better fuck off, because it's going to go off now. And he knew, because he knew me. <laughs> he walked off, and I ran at them, not spraying at them. <laughs> but, I mean, I've got gas myself, of course, but you know what? It evened the odds up a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and, is that, what, and, and because of this, this is why you left Tenerife? And I, I thought, I've come away, yes. So. Was that because the lads you end up having to tear up in there were heavy? No, was it? Or, I went back there after. Okay, okay. On my own. You just felt that time to get out of it. I thought, I, I, what am I doing? I want to start a new start. And me and Kim, and me really, I won't really behave myself. All the clubs and that. It, How old are you at this point? 20. 20. And kids yet? 
I was a bit older actually, yeah, a bit older than that. Uh, I had, my kids were five and seven when I went to prison, but they were like, I can't quite remember the ages at the time now. They had a couple of kids at the time. A couple of kids, yeah. So 93, 94, um, Aaron and Tommy. So then I went to Tenerife to get away from it all. And then that didn't go down well out there either. So Why not? Was that time sh- all timeshare going on then? John Palmer. John Palmer. Did John, you know John Mohammed? I know. I, don't, I didn't know Mohammed. He's now out there. Um, what's his first name? Mo He's from D- North London. Mohammed Durbar, no. He's a... Um, no. no, okay. I was thought of someone else. I met him out there, but he used to be in with Palmer and that. Well, yeah, Dennis New at the time was working for him. He's okay. dead now. Yeah. And he had a fella from Newcastle, I forget his name now. But when I went out there, uh, there was a fella called Tony working for him. And I had a bit of a set two with him. And that didn't end well. He went to hospital and then had to come back to England for convalescence. But that was just, you know, I was in a bar, in a, uh, I was living on the Golf Sir. Kim came out there in the end with the children. I was there last week. Was you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, Kim came out there with the kids. And I was Leonardo Villa on there at one point, And then there's people were talking about drugs in the Golf Sir. And I said, this is the Golf Sir, Like, you know, what? They, they have the European golf uh, tournament on there, one of them anyway, on the Golf Sir. So I complained to the manager. With that, I've got three fellas in front of me. One called uh, Eric Bristow, but it weren't the darts player, but he was tall like Eric Bristow. And this fella called Tony, like Popeye he was. And I'm having a rant and rave with the manager. And this geezer's gone to me. You wanna uh, calm down? I said, I've got fuck all to do with you, mate. You wanna stay out of it? And he looked at me and thought, I'll pull you in off in a minute, you little bastard. <laughs> <laughs> and, he's, and then I've carried on having a bit of a rant and a rave about it. He went, if you carry on, we're going to have to go outside. I went, like, no. And I've stood up and he stood up. I'll give him a straight left and a straight right. He's gone back and hit the door, shook his head and come back at me. So we had to tear up. He, had, he got carried out. The arm Bill, Bill come with machine gun, shot the roads off. I thought, oh, fucking hell, like, they deal with you a bit different over here. Mm-hmm. I've heard about what they do to you over here. So I went back to the house, washed the pool, in the, washed my face and all that. Before I got into the house, my little boys can see all blood on me. I didn't want them to see blood all over me. It wasn't my blood, mm-hmm. but I didn't want them to see the blood. It was only a straight fight, yeah. but he, he had quite severe injuries, the fella. About 127 stitches he had in his face. I oh, fucking hell, bruv. I know, broken no, broken bits and pieces and that. So, and I didn't hit him with nothing, just my hands, and I did nut him a couple of times, but um, he said, when I come back, I'm gonna kill you. But fucking hell, like, I'm up against it now. He's got. Palmer's got all his fellas over here. Yeah, yeah, they're um, running it. But I knew John anyway. Yeah. I thought, God. so she's come <coughs> home with the kids. So you've gone over to Tenerife for quite a life. Quite a life. <laughs> Stop, I'm going to do the timeshare. Load and all that. Like that. <laughs> Ended up having a massive, I had a few fights out there. I thought, what's going on here? So I came back to England. Uh, I left there. I stayed up there for a while. I thought, I went back to say, I said, listen, I didn't know the geezer were in hospital at the time. So I went back to this Eric Bristow's car firm. And I said, listen, tell him, whoever he wants it, we'll have another go. And he said, he can't, he's in hospital and he's going back to convalescence in England. And then he's going to come back and kill you. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, ah, oh, bleeding out. Like, I come home, fucking hell. So I stayed for about three weeks. I thought, I'm going back home. So I got an exit visa and then slipped back out because the police were looking for me. I mean, they cordoned the bleeding golf off with machine guns. And I went through the cordon because I had Kim and the kids in the car. Got them in a the car and they was looking for a single white male. The problem is out there they say that back then Palmer controlled the police as well. Oh, he, they he controlled everything. Massively. The whole island. Yeah, massively. Yeah, yeah. And other islands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a massive force John did. Mm. But he, he, he didn't know what happened at the time, but he did afterwards. Because okay. when he came away for the timeshare fraud, I was bumped into him in Long Light and he said, Kevin, Kevin, he comes straight up to me through the fence. He said, listen, I, I didn't know anything about it. I said, well, I know you didn't, John, but... Mm. Uh, None of this yeah. doesn't really matter now, it's over. What happens then then? You leave Tenerife? I left Tenerife, came home. I liked Tenerife in terms of... The trouble follow you? Yeah, you probably know about that. So I liked Tenerife for the, the north, the south of the island. I didn't like... The north shit? I didn't like fucking all the, the Las Americas and that. Okay. I liked it in the greener areas where it's rural. Oh, okay, yeah. Dark green, yeah. so it's quieter. Yeah. That's what I like. You've been out there since you've been released, no, now you're on licence. No, I can't go. Okay. Go work, go work, can't go on holiday. Mad though, isn't it? Get a job in Tenerife? Get a job, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I might open a male <laughs> lap dancing club. <laughs> See if it takes off. <laughs> so I came back to England and then got nicked in, I came back in September and got nicked in January. 
<coughs> so you get nicked for the murder in January. The man who was murdered was... Robert McGill. Who was... He was a face in the area. He was a face, protect, used to run protection rackets. Yeah. Of shops, businesses. Anyone. Was he an enforcer? Was he a bully? Uh, I, he's dead now, so I wouldn't okay. like to say that about him because he was family, but he was a, a hard, a tough cookie. Yep. No one to be messed with in the area. There was someone who messed with him, Pat Purcell, uh, certainly governed him. Okay. Uh, or he respected Pat, and if Pat had something to say, they had a few meetings and a few times over certain things, and it was dissolved, it resolved over a conversation and both went their way. So mm. that showed you mutual respect, but um, yeah, he was no fool. Okay. After he'd walk into the, your house here with a chainsaw and say, I'm now your partner. He'd do what? It'd say, for instance, you had a wine bar. Yep. You, not you per se, but yep. a businessman. Yep. And I know he'd done this, so this is actual factual. Yep. And he walked into someone's house with a chainsaw, a nice house in a really rich area, uh, revving it up, saying, I'm going to cut all your furniture up and you. Unless you pay me monthly. I'm now your partner. I'm now your partner, yeah, okay. This was back in the day, which was how this thing went. <laughs> Yeah, well, I didn't know how them things went at that time. It was new to me. There's more of it up north than it was down in the south at the time, I thought. Mm. I didn't know much about it at all because I wasn't involved in that. Okay. So I got nicked for that. But the original suspects got arrested in uh, December. And I still find it mad that the original suspects are the ones that went on to get convicted of Dave King's murder eight years later. Eight years later. But what happened was their police handler subsequently went to prison. The, and their police handler was called? Christopher Spackman. Christopher Spackman, who, so Christopher Spackman was the police officer in charge of this case, your yep. murder, for, yep. when you was arrested. Yeah. But he also was a police handler for informants. For them, for uh, previous cases. So previously to this murder, the two main suspects had been given information for cash to Spackman. Yes. So then this murder happens and they're pulled in. Yep. So they were, there was an, a, quite a few factors in relation to that for them being pulled in. Yep. Going around the area bragging about it, calling themselves Ronnie and Reggie, showing the gun off in a pub. Uh, Are these all witness statements? Witness statements. Um, the, my co-defendant, who was been charged with the, who got found guilty of the David King murder, his... Oh, was that your co-defendant, the lad who got... Yeah, convicted? yeah. Okay. So he got acquitted, obviously, but... Um, I'll come into that in a little while. He's, McGill's niece was living with my, at my co-defendant's house. McGill, okay. McGill, the lad who was murdered, the niece was living with you? Yes. Okay. And two weeks before the murder, uh, his mother was slapped around the face by McGill's sister, or sister-in-law, one of them. So his motive. Motive, um, as well as... So your co-defendant's mother was slapped by McGill's sister? Yep. So there's a family fallout going there between McGill's family and your co-defendant. And, and that was kept from the jury. But what I didn't know at the time, Kenny Collins, a Hatton Garden burglar, he had Ralph Himes. Ralph Himes had the craze. My co-defendant idolised the craze and used to write to him and visit him and all that when he was a kid. So he's, he went to get Ralph Himes as a solicitor. Ralph Himes told Kenny Collins that the deal was done. He said, my, my uh, client's getting out halfway submissions your client's going away for 30 years. So when it came to court, the police got in the dock and asked for the most, the maximum sentence to be imposed for me for 30 years. And then at halfway submission, the judge stopped the trial and told the jury to acquit Vincent. Oh, you're gonna to have to edit that. I yeah, yeah, we have edited that. that. Yeah. Right, to acquit my code D. Um, and when I say my code D, I'd only ever met him twice. And it was when I walked into a pub once, and a, uh, a party once, and they were throwing cans of beer around the front of it. I turned around and walked off. And then I was in a nightclub in, uh, Swiss cottage, and they was in there, and he, one of his pals was staring at me. I said, what's your mate staring at me for, mate? He goes, oh, I don't like his office tips. I said, well, tell him to stop staring at me. I don't like it. That's the only time I've ever met him. So the only time you've ever met him, he gets pulled in for the murder, originally, by the same police officer that he's an informant for. Yep. Yeah. And he brokers a deal, is that right? That's right, and the deal's in the book. The deal's in the book. Mm. And these would all be, these, a lot of this, as, as your, people could say, were your allegations. But as we go through this story, they've been corroborated by other police, force, other police officers who have come forward. Spackman is now in jail. He was in jail for four years, changed his name as well. It's proved that he's doctored evidence on other cases. And done the same in mine. 
with Riley? Exactly the same, that's right. So let's, let, okay, so let's well understand. Done, yeah. yeah, so let's understand. So the police, the, the police arrest him. Why, why, how, how do you get pulled in? Due to my co-defendant's confidential chats. He said, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll read it out to you in yeah, the book. On. So, just out of... And seriously, any of you, I'd get this book, I'd research this case, I've sat and read through it, it's shocking to see what the police officer, like people talk about circumstantial evidence or enough to get a retrial, which you've been trying to get, mm -hmm. and you were knocked back and knocked back and knocked back, yep. and they hid so much evidence. There's not, 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 not a little, we'll get onto it. Loads. Money evidence of money you were making in Tenerife. Loads that they didn't want, Yeah, that, but they wanted to act like you had no money. That's why you'd done Made it. Made out of skin. Made out of your skin. Yeah. When they had evidence and statements that Spackman had gone and got from Tenerife that proved you had tens of thousands again. Absolutely. Of You've got it bang on, Tommy. Which is, which, 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 which again is not giving the full picture. So the jury, because you were convicted by a jury, right? Ten to two majority on a second trial. So you can you understand when you look, you get the evidence served on you that there's stuff missing. And I remember when I was convicted, I was, before I was convicted, I said to my mother, "Listen, I'm going to get guilty here because they're lying. It doesn't add up. What the fucking hell am I doing here?" So my co-defendant, when he was arrested, this is from Detective Superintendent Winnett. Following the charging of, I can't mention his name, with being concerned in the murder of Robert McGill, I spoke confidentially with Mr. at his request. He reaffirmed that he had not been present when McGill was shot and was shocked that he had been charged with the offence. He wanted to do a deal whereby his charge would be dropped. In return, he would supply, through a solicitor, a statement accounting for his prints being in the car, the BMW that is, that was used in the murder, and he would supply on a confidential basis Details of the two persons responsible for the murder. The persons who put them up to it, including how much was paid. He stated that they had in fact been paid to kill McGill and that they were responsible for another one whereby, as blanked out, had been killed. From the limited details he gave, it was clearly referred to the murder being investigated in Surrey. He said that the killers had been paid, it's been blanked out. He intimated that the Purcell family, including Patrick Purcell, had had an involvement. He stated that for a thorough police investigation, would, would net everyone involved, with the exception of someone he referred to as Clarky, who did not get his hands dirty. He's now dead, John, and there's an absolute load of bollocks what this, he's saying, but he was a big name in the day, so yeah. straight away it had the old Bill's attention. He wanted me to think over his offer and said that he would get his solicitor down to the police station on Sunday. I informed him that any offer he decided to make would have to be properly negotiated through a solicitor. And he goes on and on and on and on. So that's, that was disclosed at court two of the old Bailey, the high security uh, court, uh, in November. I think mean, it's the 16th. This November? No, in, in 1995. Okay. It was disclosed to his solicitor uh, in a close court hearing. And then we obtained that in 1999. Uh, but by then he had been acquitted by the deal that he'd broken. And Kenny Collins had told me that he was, that, um, he was getting out at halfway submissions. How about that? Now, he couldn't predict that nine months before, could he? No, no, no. So, so, so the public, un so, so people watching this understand. He gets arrested. He sits down. I'll give you a deal. Yeah? Sorry, wait. I'll give you who it was. His prints are in the car, right? In the car. He never explained why his prints were in the car? Let's go through, because you were convicted. So you had, you had your first trial. Yeah. And what did you get? A hung jury. Hung jury, yeah. So a hung jury is when there was no majority, so then the judge, they couldn't decide whether you were guilty or not guilty, right? That's right. So they put it to a retrial. Yeah. On a retrial, you were convicted by a jury. A ten to two majority. Ten to two. So some people would say justice has been served, yeah? But that's where we need to get through all this information now, yeah? So people understand it. Your prints were in the car? They were found on a bag after I was arrested. So they had the bag three months. They'd run that bag through the home counties, Scotland, Ireland and Wales, no match to me. Arrested me, took my prints twice, said to my solicitor, we want to take his prints. My solicitor said, right, we'll stop the interview now then, to take his prints. Put did they have your prints before that? Of course they did. <laughs> banged me up, I'd have been arrested by that police force as well before. Uh, banged me up in the cell, sent my solicitor home, got me back out, took my prints, and said, are you left or right-handed? I didn't talk to put my left hand up. It was a left-handed print found on the bag. The, and that, this is what we first subsequently found out over the years, that I then went off to Kilburn ID suite to be, to, for identification break, come back, they took my prints again. They said there was a problem with the prints, they took them for a second time. I told my sister they took my prints for a second time. 
At the time that I was in the police station, the bag was taken out of the exhibits room and the tag, the seal, would have been broken and there was no signatures on it as to why it had been broken and by who. But it was the only time it had happened is when I was in the police station. And then that bag was sent off to be fingerprinted for a second time, again, and my print was found on the bag by that time. Is that all logged? All logged. And they never handed a bag over for us to, have, uh, to be examined. They said they didn't know the exact geographical location of the bag and they gave us photograph images only. Now that stinks, does it not? It, it's, it stinks even more. Isn't there a police officer who gave a statement to say that Spackman, he gave, a, he gave evidence, that Sp he'd now give evidence, now, that Spackman said he needed to get rid of a bin liner? Yes. Yeah, you know, you've done really well. Yeah, I was reading, because I was just, yeah. Cause I, cause I, when I looked at it, I thought some people would say, yeah, I'm innocent. Yeah, destroyed it. But then when I looked through, when I, when I started digging on it, I was thinking, Jesus, man. That's absolutely right. But the bag has now been found. So the bag's been found. So, yeah. so, so people understand. So a, an officer since this, you've been sent to jail. You've spent 24 years in prison. During that process, lots of different people started coming forward. You've argued your innocence the whole time. I turned to the jury and said, you made a terrible mistake. That was your I final word, this. so I didn't yeah. do this. Yeah, never did it. And I, I, I thought this is the hardest fight I'm ever going to have now. So I remember picking up. The pen, they made him exceptional triple category A in the country. The only man triple A. I was placed on remand with the IRA boys and Andy Russell, who escaped out of Whitemore, a special secure unit with an armed escape. So I was, wasn't even found guilty, but I'm triple category A, which means I've got to go have interviews through a screen with my legal team, holding up paperwork through a screen. And Michael Howard at the time, he was a Home Secretary, he authorised legal bugging of my legal visits. He said it wouldn't be used to influence a case. And above me, just you could touch it almost with your hand, was a camera. Yeah. And you got stuck. So you, you didn't know at the time there was legal bugging of your... I, I st yeah, I did. They put it I in did. the paper. Oh, okay. And the Times reported on it. Okay. That he'd authorised it. So, so just tell me then, how many kids did you have at the time of this Two. So give me, t t talk me through when you get arrested. So Where was you? I was, I moved, moved to Potton. I know Potton. Yeah, I moved there, well, my ex moved there. Big travel size. That's right, yeah, I went on there. John Davis, I walked onto that site, banged on his front door, said, I want my fucking car back. So, <laughs> yeah, and he looked at me, for what are you doing? And I said, I don't give a fuck, you live in caravans, and you cannot live in caravans while you got my car, because I will set the lights on them all. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I get my car back. He said, I can't have trouble with you, mister. <laughs> yeah, and I said, well, listen, and he looked at me, for well, you must have some bollocks to come on the site on your own. Yeah, we'll give him back his car. Give him back, we did. He got the car back and paid for the damage. Um, I'm only not me for 1500 quid, but I got, got nicked for the murder, cheeky bastard. Yeah. So I was selling counterfeit clothes and perfumes, not all counterfeit, but he was taking loads of it and moving it. And I got banged up, I me 1500 quid, but that's not, he's dead now, so I won't talk ill of him. Would you say at the time of this murder, you yourself had become a big face? In London. You're running a hundred, the, up with the doors, 120 yeah. doors, you were a face, yeah. because that's a, you've got to be a face to be able to have the doors back in those days. And have people respect you. Yeah, 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 because you know, you've, you've got to be a bit of a heavy. I would just turn up and say, well, me and you, let's yeah. do what men do best and have a straightener. Okay. Simple as that, I don't care how big you are, but we'll have a straightener mm. and we'll shake hands after. And but I, it went like that, really. The lads respected me. So I would never turn, I would never say, who am I working with? I'd say, what well, problem, where is it? Yeah. And I'd go there. And if you was working somewhere, Tommy, I would turn up. Mm. So what are you doing here, Kevin? I said, well, I can, I'll come in here to make sure you're all right as well. Yeah. You know, and I would always turn up with my lads and they respected yeah, yeah. me for that. Yeah. And they would say, I'll get Kevin, get Kevin, we'll have Kevin. Yeah. I thought, well, that's pretty good. I was only like a young kid at the time. So yeah, I was respected in, in that manner, but you're too young to really understand that. You know, you, it's, I was more like, oh, of course I've got a load of birds with me. I'll walk into any club with a load of people. So it was a bit, probably went to me head a bit, I accept that. Yeah. But it's more about money for me, it's about money, 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 money. I wanted to earn money and do well and go on. So, I got Nick for the... Yeah, where, where, where was you when you got Nick for the murder? Potton. And the, I See, remember I remember your missus and kids. Well, first of all, I went to Newcastle. I went up to Newcastle and I had a fight with some doormen up there. <laughs> your and, uh, story is just, I had a fight with him, I was yeah. fighting there. I went here, is there anywhere you've been without a fight? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> but if you've got a nice bird on your arm and you look like a bleeding idiot, people will start on your <laughs> tripod <laughs> bird. So there was two rugby players actually, and they were dormant, and they, one picked me up like that, literally, my little legs were dangling like that, they were. And they, they came in, and one of the hacker and something else they were called, and it hit a couple of people in the barber area, and then he was making a beeline for my mate Chris Hampton. And I thought, well, you ain't getting to him, I knocked him spark out. 
But the next thing, I often picked up. Literally, I, he, hadn't, he was just coming to one of my mates and give him a bang, so I banged him. He's gone to sleep. I've got picked up. I thought, oh yeah, no problem. Pulled out the gas, gassed him. I'm standing outside. The whole fucking gaff emptied on me. There must have been, not the whole gaff, but there's about 30 blokes standing in front of me. Oh, well, come on then. And like, <laughs> they weren't too sure. I thought, I've only got a little bit left. <laughs> so I got in the motor and went back. I got Nick for that. And then I went, I got bail. I went back to Hexham Magistrates Court and got arrested by the old Bill. They brought me back down to Watford Police Station by Blue Light. Arrested by the old Bill for? Old Bill for the murder of Robert. Oh, McGill. so he wasn't home when they got arrested? No. And then they, okay. I got arrested at Hexham Magistrates Court for fighting with the two doormen. Uh, got bail. And then they arrested me at Hexham, took me home. I got booked to the police station. Got bail again. Bail on the murder? Got bail on the murder. Uh, after I didn't get picked out on an ID parade, but that's when they took my prints twice. Got me. So there were witnesses to, there were witnesses who saw two men in a car. Two, oh, but then hold on, I got arrested again. They bailed me, and then I got arrested at home. Okay. And they, I'm remembering part on the the phone went early hours in the morning, and uh, I picked it up and they said, "Someone, please come out." So they didn't come through my front door, which is quite unusual. Um, they get away from the window. Get away from the window. Or well, so the I'm, intelligence they're getting given. You could have one of them. Yeah, yeah. If they yeah. if they believe in, you may have been set up by some police officers, but the police officers who are sent out to get you. Yeah. You're armed. You've killed they, something. I think they thought I will use it if they come yeah, yeah. through the door. Yeah. So that's why they phoned up. Yeah, obviously I didn't want to say that, but that's what they thought. Yeah. So uh, I came out and I got arrested at home. Took to uh, well, obviously when I got bailed on the first occasion, that's when they needed to get my uh, substantial evidence against me, and that's why they got the print on the bag. Uh, and I was rearrested, like I say, at home in Potton, and then. Remanded. So then from the day of that remand? Went to court and they said, under new forensic evidence found. That's what they stated in court. We have Lane's print on the bag, it's got firearm residue on it. And I thought, you lying bastard. And on this, this bag in the, this bag was in what car? So I had a car nicked off from my home in Potton. It was a Ford Cosworth. And they had it one night, took a part off the engine to stop it being nicked and had a mobiliser on it and everything. And they still managed to take it. And that was the travellers in, uh, Potton, yep. like that John Davis, so that's how come I went on to the site and say, because my missus just said, listen, we had the travellers round here today, it's a private estate, they come and looked at your car and reversed back out. And then that evening there was a round raid uh, somewhere in the area they used to, for fags. Because they're famous for the cash points over cash there. Cash points. Over that, that, on that site. Low. And the police yeah. don't even follow them back, they just grab them and drive back to the site. <laughs> I could, yeah, but listen, I know they are. Please no, just give up. Active. Yeah, yeah they were active. Well, were active, yeah. I've gone back 15 years. But they were ramming, doing fags and all. Mm. So I knew that they had had my car, and that's why I went onto the site. Got the car back, uh, and then I was loaned a car, which was a 320 BMW. I went to look at an next Loaned a car by? Uh, family, um, member of my family, or my partner's member of his, her family, lent me the car. I went to look at an Astra, I went to look at an XR2 and a BMW, and it was all, like the money weren't, it was too much money for what they were, or that something weren't right about the car. So my partner's uncle turned around and said, I've got a car you can borrow here. I've got to pick this car up. It was a oh, I told banger. And I'd come down to London with Kim and the kids uh, in it that weekend. It's blowing smoke and all the rest of it. And I went to a club called Broadway Boulevard where I used to work the door. I was only 20, you had to be 21 to get in there. So I went to there with Kim, my brother, and Bradley Verity. Took the car back, because it was a right old shitter, smoking and everything. The car that was seen at the scene was a 323i. And a, a BMW mechanic had walked round the car, giving the police a picture of the wheels that was on the car and a colour match. And he said the rear parcel shelf was beige, uh, and the car that I was loaned was had black anthracite. It wasn't beige, so the car at the scene was different. Okay. So and then, but I the police, yeah, they was, and the police didn't want to. They stripped the car down, stripped it, took the engine out, took it, took all the covers off the furniture, and off the seats, and everything. So when we managed to gain access to the car, we was given a run around and that by a car specialist. It had been stripped, absolutely stripped. But it wasn't the, the car that I was loaned was just copied, and the car was used at the scene, like I say, it was a different colour, different okay. engine size. <coughs> But by now, that number plate was connected to me. And they're saying that in that car they found your fingerprints. Yep. But they also found Vincent's fingerprints. All over, yeah. All the over bag the car. And the car, yeah. And um, your fingerprints were on a bag, and your reason for that was. 
that you borrowed the car. I've been in the boot with a car. But it weren't just your fingerprints, your kids' uh, fingerprints. I think kids' fingerprints was on it. My kids' fingerprint was on paperwork in the car from drawings and that. And the car... So, uh, so as a hitman, because I've seen newspapers label you as the executioner. Yeah. yeah. The alleged executioner. Yeah. They're saying you're a professional executioner. Yeah. But in that case, you wouldn't be a very good executioner if you're taking your family car. That doesn't. That part of it doesn't make sense at all. Right, and that car was just being, the, just that part. Just that part. But that car, Tommy, was being seen driven by another individual after I'd returned the car. Okay. By so a police officer who knew me and said, "I see that car being driven on this date by th- by someone else, and it was not Kevin Lane driving that car, and he had dark hair that matched the description of the gunman." So they know the car was out of your possession. Yeah. You, you accept you were driving the car because you borrowed it. Yeah. That's how your fingerprints. Did Vincent ever have to explain how his fingerprints got in the car? No, because he was acquitted halfway through by he the didn't even have to. He, he wasn't even asked. He didn't have to explain why. When he got arrested, he said, I knew this was going to happen because I've been bragging about doing it all over the place. I've been giving it the large, he said, all over the place. And it's all got out of hand. So. The mad thing is, like this could, like people may doubt bits of it, but Vincent's gone on to be convicted of another, of, a, of a, another hit. He's gone and killed someone with AK forty seven. So the man that's fingerprints are in the car, the man that's done the deal with the police, has gone on eight years later to execute someone else. And bragging about it, and bragging about other murders. Yeah. I don't know if he has. If he tells people he's killed more people than Freddy Krueger, he's quite egotistical. This fellow, my co-defendant. But he's an actual, he put a gun in his hand, he might be dangerous, but other than that, he's an arsehole. So you, so what's going on in your red at this time? You're arrested, you're then remanded. What do you think when they tell you your fingerprints on the back? Well, I was told, at the court, I thought, that ain't right. I've had my prints taken twice. It's something so at, just to re, re-go through that again. Your prints are taken, as if ta- as you're in custody, someone has gone and accessed the bag. Yeah, and taken And there's the records of, of officers opening that bag, but there's not a record of which officer opened the bag. There you go. And that's at the same time that you're in custody. Yep. So it's as though your print might not have been on the bag. It's been placed onto the bag. Exactly. Exactly that. And they would never give us the bag to be tested, which is another bleeding. And they still haven't to this day. Still haven't to this day. So I then go away. Yep. My co-defendant's kept in different prisons up and down the country. He's having police visits. And a pal of mine, Tony Daniels, he was in the scrubs at the time. And Gary Nelson had got done for shooting PC. Dunn was in there. He'd, he'd had a row in the, in the unit and they sent him on a lay down, I think. Well, I can't say my co-defendant yep. had gone. They was keeping him in the scrubs. And then giving him cell association with Gary Nelson. I've never heard of people having cell association in the block. Never. And at the same time... The block, so is, the block is a separation isolation unit within the prison system where the most dangerous criminals are put, yeah? Yeah, and, or and if you've been nicked or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, if you've got a nick in, but nick in, yeah. you're not allowed to mix with other prisoners. No. I've been down... I've done ten blocks. Yeah, you know, didn't you? Yeah. So you're not allowed to see anyone. No, you, you can talk out the windows and see yeah, anyone yeah, yeah, in the yeah. yard sometimes. But he was having cell association with Nelson and then... At the same time, Tony Daniel would see police officers in my co-defendant's cell talking to him. Coppers in his cell. And I've got other evidence in the book where a uh, special visit on Freeze Landing when he was moved to Birmingham. Police interview went well, no problems. And it, it, there's plenty of that in there. So how long did Vincent serve? He served, he did nine months and got acquitted. He got nine months and got acquitted, not by jury, but by the judge. By the judge. So they didn't let the fact go that his prints were in the car. It'd been the jury weren't told his prints were in the car. None of this. The jury didn't get to hear any of this. So Did, this was all withheld from the jury. Exactly. They should have been, the jury should have been put to them that he's been shown off a gun in a pub. He's connected to the car. But what is worse than this, the gentleman got caught with a car, his name Leonard Bennett. He had been going around. He made a statement, turned around and said, my co-defendant and his, uh, his mate David Smith I'd give him the car and ask him to burn it. That statement was suppressed and withheld from me until 2007. So 12 on. years later. So the car that was used, someone gave a statement at the time saying that Vincent and Thingy asked him to burn the car. Yeah, give it to him and ask him to destroy it. And that was held, withheld. He got caught with the car. He got caught with the car and then, bloody hell. Yeah, and that was suppressed. So any evidence that brought the case to them was suppressed. 
or he wasn't. I mean, I, any questions in relation to the? Were you aware back then of any of this? None at all. So you weren't aware of any of this. You maintained your innocence. Mm. I thought, how can this have happened to me? What is going on here? They've just cleaned the books up here, and I thought this ain't right. Now the IOA boy said to me, Kevin, this ain't wrong here. Your co-defendant's up to no good because he should be here with you. He's been moved around the country. What's going on? For quite a fair statement, isn't it? Yeah. Some people could say, well, because to stop you building a case together. But he refused a co-defendant's conference to share evidence and discuss the evidence in the case because we're fighting with you. And then we now, and you now know, because we've got this statement that he gave straight away, which he asked for a deal to put the blame on you. I've even had his custody record and he signs it in five places. Five places. When he said, I want to talk to the police on a confidential basis about assisting them and the advantages of assisting them with this case, and he signs it. And the advantage of, and with the police, would you have been a face that they were worried about, that they would have wanted off the street? What was Spackman's motive for this? What would you say the police officer, Spackman, who's the police officer who had Vincent as an informant, who's the police officer who's falsified evidence, who's then gone to prison, yeah? What would his motive be? He nicked me years earlier for ringing cars. Yeah. And I remember him coming to my house when I was about 21. And I just bought a new house. Lamar lived down the same, pretty much the same street. Remember the singer Lamar? Yeah, yeah. A uh, nice house. I just had a front extension on it. I'd had all marble and gates and I'd had all the back garden done. Uh, I was only a young kid, obviously. He said, you got a better house than me? I said, I've changed your job then. He didn't like that. It's <laughs> like car ringing, bro. Car, yeah. <laughs> but I was buying this, I was, yeah, I mean, it was a lucrative business, but I was also working as well. But I thought, I'd go and get a car for four grand, get a dodgy material, get a, 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 a nicked interior, and I'd sell it for 14. It's good you I say, I say it's good you're honest in the sense that you were clearly was a colourful character. Yeah. Mm. So at the time, because I was thinking when I was looking at this, thing, thinking, well, how does someone get fitted up? How... How does someone have these associates? How does someone be in this position? By having a door security firm. And yeah. then when Spackman nicked me, so I'll have you one day, he came into my cell and he said, you think you're the guff boss of this lot, didn't you? And he gave me a bit of verbal and I jumped off the bed to fucking get and hit him. And he slammed the door in my face and said, I'll have you one day. And then I remember when I got nicked, I thought, where do I know that name? Where do I know that name? And then the light bulb came on. I thought, that's the bastard that said he's going to have me one day. Let me, uh, let me, um, where was you on the morning of the murder? At home. Pardon? You had an alibi? Yeah. Spackman went, went round to my house, so the mother of my children, she's quite, she's like an English rose. She's a very pretty, very sweet girl. And Spackman had went to her work, he'd been to her gym, he'd phoned her up at home, and he said, we're going to arrest you and put you in the dock. She didn't know any different at the time, you know, and he was, Obviously, intimidating her. Intimidating and frightening her. She was my alibi. So I said, You got to call her. My boss said, We're not calling her because it looks too obvious that um, you're calling your missus to give evidence for you. I said, I don't give two monkeys. Get her and call her because her evidence will be quite clear and truthful. I didn't know at the time that my QC had been to the rugby game, Twi Twickenham, with the prosecution during the trial on the weekend. And they used to be in the same chambers. He never told me that when I took him on. Yeah. He refused to call her. He refused to call her. And there's other stuff he refused to call her. Like, did did she, she give a statement ever? Yes, to my uh, solicitor. At the start? Yeah. but Before she, all this? Yeah. yeah. So there's a documented statement that she gave, but he yeah. refused to call her. So Kevin never you know, I, was, I know this doesn't sound so... I've done the mortgage fraud charge, yeah? But they had nothing on me, right? right? And, and I've done the mortgage fraud charge, and it was, what's his name? It was his last, the prosecutor, when, when we first heard the prosecutor's name, my barrister said, oh, fucking hell, I said, what? He goes, he's bent as fuck. I said, what do you mean he's bent as fuck? They said, he's bent as fuck, he's Noel Lucas. Sorry, Noel, because he's now a judge, so I hope that I end up before. This was his last trial. So he was a prosecutor, straight after stitching me on my case, yeah? He was a judge. So he went straight from being the prosecutor to begin giving his position as a judge as soon as I was sent off to jail for just totally stitched up on some bullshit case. But you... Um, Spackman became a detective inspector. Did he? Yeah, as a result. And he got his own police station in Boreham Wood. A lot of the people involved in this at the time, because we're going back 20, 25 years, have all gone on, progressed to have high-ranking positions. High-ranking and retired. So there's been a number of investigations in my case. Okay. There was one's called Operation Cactus, and it was a, a review of the evidence to see if they could recharge it. Win it. Was this after he killed someone else? 
Yeah. So once he's gone and killed someone else, they realise, hold on, we had him nicked for another murder. And, and by which time him. then Spackman's now in prison himself, so he's got no one to protect him. Spackman's what? In prison himself. Oh, because Spackman's gone. So, so talk to me about that. Let's go through that bit. So Spackman is the officer in charge. You're in jail. You're doing life. Uh, at which point do you even find out Spackman's in jail? I was told by Stephen O'Leary in the paper. He said, I've just seen that copy. Stephen O'Leary, journalist? No, he's a oh. pal of mine. Oh, okay. And he goes, uh, Steve O'Leary, uh, he, he's from my area. He said, he's been nicked, Kevin, for theft of 160 grand from the police. Of falsifying statements and all sorts of stuff. Uh, and I thought, fucking hell, like, I'm going home now, surely. But it didn't Because when a co officer's caught being corrupt, they look through all the previous cases, usually. 22 cases. And, uh, oh, they looked at 22 cases for him. So basically, so he was confiscating money, confiscated £160,000. Then he set up an account in a bogus name that was in the same name as the criminal who he took the yeah, money off yeah. and transferred the money, which was actually going to themselves. So Made statements from people, put them in as matters of truth, opened up bank accounts, went down the births and death certificates. We're not talking about a little bit of fraud here. The cop was, the police, this police officer was bent, corrupt. Bent and corrupt. Taking money from Signing, everyone. Signing uh, driving licenses, practicing the signatures on them, getting them right and things like that. And buy another one because you messed it up. Practicing on his pad on his desk, the signatures. He had bullets in his desk and all that he couldn't answer for. Things like that. Tell me about, because with him signing and, and being committed for fraud, in your case, I believe there was when police seized some paperwork, there was a name Riley. Can you explain? Yeah, me? so. Explain to me what happened I there. I had a ledger of Dorman who worked for me. A what? In fact, it wasn't my ledger, it was, a, it was a Michael Paris's ledger. It was a. Uh, every person's name who worked for me and where they'd worked, uh, whatever venues they worked, operatives I used to call them. Mm. So in there there was a, a fellow called Riley, John Riley. The car that was su supposedly used in the murder was purchased by Mr O'Reilly, but it was spelled O-R-I-E-L-L-Y. The gentleman that worked for me was just spelled R-I-L-E-Y, Riley. So in the book, written in pencil, was the name O'Reilly. In the front of the book were the names of the people who worked for me and their phone numbers, and O was put in front of the R. And a graphologist, I guess, has proved this? Um, yeah. And by an expert? No, we've not, we've not been given access to it to get it done. Oh, you haven't? No. Okay, so you had someone called... Okay, so you had, you had someone called John Riley. When they've seized all your paperwork, they've then used as evidence that it doesn't say John Riley, it says O'Reilly. They changed it to O'Reilly. We called the number next to the name O'Reilly and John Riley come to call. And, and John Riley kind of come to call and said, that's me? That's me. I ain't John O'Reilly. My name's John, my name's John Riley, spelt differently. So someone's altered it? Someone's altered it. it. And Spackman's been done for altering names in, in, in other cases from uh, being returned or evidence being returned to him and falsifying statements. So he's been proven to do exactly what he's done in mine in other cases. And that would have been another bit of evidence that would have helped point the finger at you. That's a doubt. So the officers that are involved in my case, yep. investigating Operation Cactus, <coughs> they refused to be interviewed by their own police force. So half of your police conducted an investigation to see if they could recharge my co-defendant. The officers who are in charge of my case refused to be interviewed by their own colleagues. So they're now denying their own Chief Constable's order. So Chief Constable wants the case we investigated to charge Vincent. The police officers are in charge of your case that we are look at, we believe, or you believe, have set you up and let Vincent off, refuse to give evidence. Refuse to give evidence. And refuse to be, even to be interviewed. Interviewed, interviewed. And further to that, the officers that are investigating the case will refuse access to the papers in the case. All the papers in the case. Now that cannot be right by their own police force. How can even, that be? Even, even I read when each of these, another investigation, it's by their own police force. If there's a... If there's a if there's an issue of corruption within Hertfordshire Police, you don't get Hertfordshire Police to investigate no, Hertfordshire Police for corruption. In Ireland, they get another police force to do it. And that's how it should be everywhere, you, surely? You think so. So you go further on to that. <clears throat> I got released from prison. I got downgraded from Category A to... Tell, 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 me, what, tell, me, what, tell me what your first, first instance of jail is. What was it like? Where did you go? You're, I went to Belmarsh Special Secure Unit. That's a special secure unit that, that was the, the jail within a jail. Yeah. That, like, that, that, was, that they got rid of. Like Colditz. Yeah, yeah, it was the main... Flashing, like still, they've still got it. 
flashing lights and all the rest of it and helicopters going over all the time. Armed old Bill whenever you get moved and things like that. They've got to shut the whole prison down to bring you out of that unit just to go to the doctors in the main prison and bang everybody up. That's how severe they took it. Everyone's got to be locked up when you come out of that fucking unit. Madness. How old were your children? Five and seven. What's their names? Tommy and Aaron. Tommy and Aaron, two boys. Yeah. So your boys are five and seven, you've just been banged up for life. Yeah, and they're seeing the dad through a screen. That, then I ended up not seeing him for you nine years. Him. Fuck off. Fucking broke me up. Well, as a double, as that maximum security, you weren't allowed contact? Oh, not touching anybody. You've got to see people through a screen. You can't touch no one. When I went into the unit, there'd be a camera there. And the screws used to say to me, right, they never said it to me, but these are the rules. If you turn now, they'll terminate your visit because then you could be whispering something. I said, hold on a minute. You've got a camera on me there. You've got a camera on me there. You're sitting here, two screws behind me. And now you're, now you're saying I could be miming something to the, my missus sitting opposite me. On my five and seven year old kids. Five and seven, and so the five and seven year old kids would go out of this door here into another door which is just as far away to a toilet. They'd come out of there, be rubbed down and searched, come back in here. But I'm on a closed visit, permanently closed visit. My clothes I used to have to give in two days before. They would x ray those clothes They'd, and I would go back in the strip search room, take all my clothes off that I've just worn on a visit, give them back to them, then they'd go off and x ray them again. Where have I been? You've got two cameras on me. You've got two screws sitting opposite with the missus and, and the kids. Screen. A class screen, and all I'm doing is sitting here. What have I managed to smuggle or do in my clothes? That's how mad it was. In the cell, on, out, on the outside of my cell, I had two deadbolts with two chub lugs on them. And it was that, they come off, and then it's electronically controlled by a room outside of the unit. So they're pushing the intercom so you can open up cell seven, or whatever the cell was at the time that I was, I was being moved into, because you move cell twice a month in there. Uh, when you're in the units, then the units anyway. And, and, and what effect does that, that there, what, what does that have well, on, it's, a, on a father? It's, it's and terrible. On, and on the kids. So when I came home from prison, I split up with the, I had a baby with a girl and... When you got out after 20 yeah, years? Yeah, she got pregnant in like, straight away like that. And we lived together, but it just weren't right. Uh, she stopped me seeing my son and I had a, bra a breakdown over it because this, when I went to see a psychiatrist about it, they said, all the pain that you've suffered from not seeing your other two boys for those years... It's come out now. It's come out again. Because you didn't see your dad as a kid, you've got your dad's pain, your kid's pain, and it's just all been released now. And it, it did, it, it broke me. It's thanks to that I had a successful business, I turned over 1.7 million off of one company, and I had quite a well, few... Well, once you come out of jail? Yeah, within a year I built a company up and I had... Quite a few staff work for me. I've still we'll got we'll get, I will go through all that. I want to bring it. I will go through all that because that's a success story. You're obviously mm. an entrepreneur. Well, I have a go, but uh, dot. I'm having a go. Yeah, I have a, a character. Go. But when those years, you done nine years of only seeing your children behind the glass screen. Yeah, well, I got downgraded from exceptional risk after two and a half years down to high risk. But by then, as an exceptional risk in those two and a half years, what's your association in jail? None. You're in a unit. So you're on solitary. Yeah, it's pretty solitary. You got you mixed with other inmates. There were seven of us in the unit at the time, uh, and that was it. We didn't see anybody or come out. And how how what at the time? How was that at the time? And did you do do you years after that look back and think how was that? God, it was nutty. You had a phone box in there where you, you had to divvy up the time of association between phone calls. You'd have eleven minutes to make a phone call your children and your missus, or whoever you got a call, 11 minutes. No phone calls in the daytime, like on the other wings, just in the evening. You can't make a phone call until they push a button, so off you go. So you're waiting call. on them every time? Yeah. And so then, then they're, you're... they're writing down what you're making and the, the call about what you're saying, and then recording it. It's t and then in, on the cell, you check every 20 minutes. I was forever looking like that. You were, I thought I had a well, they open the, they open the thing? The flat. The so flat. every 20 minutes, every, all night? All night, so we're sitting in there watching TV, right? And the cell comes up. Every 20 minutes, right? But So outside of the cell, but it, it, when you're in that cell, every 20 minutes you're checked all through the day and night, okay, when that door's locked. So we're sitting here watching TV, there's a camera on us there, there's a camera on us there, and there's a wall there with windows in it, and staff are standing there watching you. We haven't moved, we're sitting here watching the film. Every 20 minutes in the daytime... It's all psychological days. They come in, walk around you, Go up to the bolts and bars that they've just done 20 minutes before, 
bang the bolts and bars, look behind the TV, look <coughs> in the bin, walk back out, stand up there and watch her. And in 20 minutes, I come back in and do the same thing again. So the unit sounds like a psychological torture. There was a screen there, <coughs> back out where psychologists used to look at us. And in the, in the box, you know what the box is, don't you, Tommy? It's a, a strip box. So when you, you've had an altercation with staff, they take your clothes off, put, put you naked, naked in, in the, the strip box. I spent a, a very long time in them boxes. Mm. I lost track of days in there. And they meant to be taken... you lost track of days sitting naked? Just day and night, day and night. So you're shivering at night because the sun goes down. You've got sores on your body because you've got nothing to sit on that's soft, it's concrete. And, you, and you're meant to, it's meant to de break you because you're naked. Eventually you get so used to it. But um, does it break you? No, it never broke me. Do you think the public probably. are aware of this sort of punishment that goes on within the prison system? No, but in that box was a parapet wall with a perspex ceiling where psychologists could walk around and write down on you while you're sitting there. Like, like you're a study? Studying you. Studying how you react to the torture? Studying to the torture, yeah. But it was terrible. Just looking at them. Yeah. And it would be terrible if you'd executed someone. Anyway, the punishment would be terrible. But how is it... If you're, how is the level of your feeling of injustice, father of two, taken away, sitting, going through this? I was so angry. Yeah, that's what, ha, 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 angry at who? The system. And anybody who was no good. And if you're angry at the system, I guess that means you're rebelling, so you're not having a clean sentence. Not at all. I was fighting with the staff all the time. All the time. And, and, and other cons who were known to be wrong or smell about them. Mm. I, I had great problems with them arseholes. Mm. Well, they had problems with me. So I wouldn't just wouldn't have it. I said, I'm not fucking living with them. So I, walk, I landed in the unit, and there was a fellow in there called Simon Bowman. He's dead now. Was Vic Dark in there when you were in there? Vic was in there, not in the unit, though. Vic was on the mainstream at the time. He was, he was in the whole was on that, unit. He was on that unit, he? Whole unit. He was. Oh, he was when he got nicked for the, the murder the second That's time. Right. He went to Belmarsh. He did, yes. Mm. Not to Whitemore. He was high risk, and then okay. he, he got, luckily, he got not guilty, thank God. Mm. But. And he was put on my mind and all in Whitemore, on the main landings and all, which is quite unusual. Mm. So I'm sure he was, because I remember seeing him down the gym. He was in there, but I'm not sure if it was for a mind at the time, but he, he was. He was on my mind in Whitemore, mainstream prison, mm. okay, which is unusual. So there's a fellow called Simon Bowman in the unit, and he was in there for sending a, a make relief bomb to his missus and his kids, uh, armed robber. He's dead now. Someone killed him and cut him up, all right, his co defendant did. But he was a known informer. Andy Russell flew the helicopter into Gartry. Oh, he got caught really? on the wall in Long Larton and he had a set of keys in a Marvel tin. And he gave this Marvel tin that was sealed to this Simon Bowman who was a block cleaner. Now all block cleaners were either nonces or grasses years ago. Mm. All right? And that Simon Bowman took him straight away and gave him to the PO on the wing. So when I was in the unit, Danny McNamara and that, he says, Kevin, he got done for the Hyde Park bombing and he got fitted up because they found out they'd fitted him up with his print on a bag. You know, a solicitor. So he said, Kevin, he said, that Simon Bowman's no good, mate. He's a grass. I said, oh, is that right, is it? I said, oh. It's a straight away the head's going. I thought, oh, they've got a grass in the unit, got a grass in the unit. I thought, I'm not having him in that unit with me. He's a big lump. But that don't make no difference, does it? I mean, he could be fucking five yeah. foot seven. Nine stone that you can punch like a bleeding mm. hole mm. if you can punch right. Mm. So I've landed in Whitemore. I remember when I was in Belmore, should I say, they came down to interview me and said, uh, I was in the adjudication room, so they've got long tables. There's a governor's down there, and you're down there. Mm. Two staff were sitting down there, right? And they, they said, We've come to interview you, Kevin. And I know one of the staff now, fair, fair play to him, to make your, sm your transition into the unit smooth. I said, I don't give two monkeys about your unit. I said, I'm going to burn it and smash it down when I get in there. I'm not having your rules. Eight pieces of toilet paper a day, you give me them, and when I want some more, I've got to get on the bell when I'm having a crap. I need some more paper. I said, I'm not having it, but I was so angry. I said, I'm going to smash it up. So when I landed in, in Whitemore, there was three Alsatians waiting for me in reception, and a sea of screws. And I never forgot it. Pebbles, I used to call her. Screws were doing the biometrics, did it once, did it twice, and I'm thinking, right, you're at, you're at the game, I know what you're up to. She's come straight through, get out of the way, get out of the way, Kevin, come here, give me your fingerprint. She did it for me straight away, passed. Got to the unit, and there was Coleman Mulcairins and uh, Georgie Sampson and Wayne Hurran out of North London. Uh, he's dead now, Wayne, he's got rest his soul. Uh, made a film about him called Armed and Dangerous. Proper fellow, Wayne. Mm. And they've gone, Kevin, Kevin, Wait for us to come out and see you because they knew what I was like at the time, like a cocked, cock bleeding ammo, so to speak. I said, I'm pacing the cell, and I 
back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Before this door's open, it's going to go off. So, door's open. I've stepped out, I've looked to the right, I've seen this geezer walking along doing this. There's only one geezer in here who's from fucking, who's a, uh, and he's a, he spoke like a Geordie, but he was from Sunderland or Middlesbrough, somewhere like that, Sunderland I think he's from. I thought, that's that Simon so Bowman, it can only be him, because I know there's only one Geordie in here, and he's doing this, isn't he? I turned around, walked up to him, and went, crack! And he was unconscious on his feet, crack with a left hook as well, second one. He was unconscious for minutes on the floor. And I leant over him, and he's asleep, and all the screws were standing there like that around me. Didn't wrap me up or nothing. I said, no one can ever say I've ever told him anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Gareth Singer... This Bruce was the Street. snitch, yeah? So people, so people were going with the story. This is the bloke who had given the key... Yeah, to the, to the screws to the when screws. he was in the block. Gives Andy, Ru Andy the keys that Andy Russell had given him. So, Gav Singer, big screw. He's gone, Kevin, Kevin, he said, you've got to go to the block. I said, yeah, no problem. Go to the block. And I remember going into the block, didn't put me in the box, because I didn't nip one of the staff. Put me in a normal cell, got me a pen and paper, and I picked it up. I said, this is going to be the hardest fight I've ever had. And I wrote to David Jessel of Trial and Hour. That's the first letter I ever wrote. You wrote who? David Jessel. Who's you know, David Jessel? He, was, he used to do the uh, Trial and Hour, which is like Rough Justice. What's that? Rough Justice was a programme for Miss Cal They had 70 oh, Miss Justice. Justice okay. with Joanne Short. Yeah, she was the... Uh, okay, historically, I remember. Yeah, remember that? Yeah, yeah. So she now used to work for the Innocent Project. She's now gone to something else. But through her... What year was this? Uh, that was in 1996. So you've been in jail a couple of years? A couple of years. And then you, what, you picked up... What, then you thought... What, at that point, you thought you want to start fighting for your justice? Yeah. I had to, I thought... Uh, I'm out of the blue? Just I'm not out of the blue, what I mean is, nothing had happened outside, no outside influences of police officers coming forward. At this point, you just, you wrote to him, maintaining your innocence. Because yeah. I think if people, I think the storyline's very important for when people realise you started saying this then, you've said it from day dot, yeah. but then lots of things have happened in the last 10 years God, that so have fell in, things. that you find out that they hid. No. Hid, lied, police officers coming forward, like I say. Sally Chidsoy, she was a BBC journalist. She's interviewed people who said the same to her, that I was innocent. Duncan Campbell interviewed police officers. They said I'm innocent. Police officers actually on record saying this? Saying it on record. And they've come forward recently, um, I say recently, with statements. It's been years. Derek Webb, he had a file taken from his house. Derek was the next police officer from Watford Police Station. And the file was a miscarriage of justice of Kevin Lane file. He got arrested for the illegal bugging and reporting in Whitemore Prison when they were bugging Sadiq Khan. Okay. Remember that? As a and there was someone giving information about that. And he was visiting a terrorist in uh, Woodhill Prison, okay. a friend of his, okay? And they bugged him. Sadiq Khan's friend was a terrorist? Terrorist, right, in Woodhill Just Prison. Just get that clear. Sadiq Khan's friend was a terrorist? Yes, arrested for terrorism. And they bugged his, uh, his interview, so. right? So, MI6 then raided Derek Webb's house and took every single piece of paperwork, filed everything out of the house. Uh, it was brought to my attention and I wrote to various police forces and I managed to get some stuff, an exhibit, and it had Thames Valley and Essex on it. I thought, what are Essex police doing on a joint venture with Thames Valley police? <laughs> anyway, I got nowhere with it. They wouldn't give it, nothing to me. So uh, Heather Mills, the journalist for Private Eye, she contacted me and said, I've just sat through the Derek Webb trial. Bearing in mind the police have denied that my file even existed. Derek Webb, the police officer, was now a private investigator. And what happened was that he, he realised that the royal family never changed their cars. They kept the same car for the same member of the royal family. That's a massive security breach. They don't do it no more, of course. Uh, and as a result of that, they raided Derek Webb's house, as, as well as part of the, the investigation into Sadiq Khan and that. Heather Mills was sitting through Derek Webb's trial and the miscarriage of justice of Kevin Lanefold came up and they put it under public immunity interest, which means sensitive material. So although they denied it existed, it's just come up in a trial that it does exist okay. and they still haven't given it to me. And Derek Webb turns around and says, there's material in there that says Kevin Lane's innocent and I still haven't got it today. Have you been following the recent thing with the post office story? Mm. Yeah. Mm. So basically what... Only by radio. Only by radio, but what that shows is when the public are fully aware of a situation, that's when justice comes. Of course it is. They cover it up and cover it up and cover it up. Do you think 
Is there anything happening now since your release from prison, since a lot of the information that's in here has come forward, since witness statements, police officers, a lot of this stuff, is there anything that tells you that this will get to the public in... in, in so I've just been granted legal aid. You've just been granted legal aid? Yeah. To what? Uh, to go back to the Criminal Cases Review Commission. To ask for a, a retrial? A retrial. Panorama conducted an investigation through Mark Daly, the reporter for Panorama, yeah. and uh, uh, Louis Shortier from the Innocent Project. They conducted an investigation into uh, the police. At trial, the jury were told that my print on a bag was holding a, uh, a Mossberg pump action shotgun inside that bag. And inside that bag was firearm as you that said a used gun had been in there or used ammunition. And it was, the mark on the print says it was a Mossberg pump action that I was gripping. I'm sitting there thinking, you lying bastards. I know I haven't gripped a gun in that bag, so I know you're telling lies. They did a test on it. Tracy Alexandra of City Westminster Police conducted a test for the Innocent Project. And she's now been refused to make, so she can't make a statement in relation to this now. The police have stopped her making a statement, although she's on camera, on panorama, turned around and said, absolute rubbish. Should never have been said. Could have been a cardboard box in there, but it weren't a fucking gun. So the jury had been told that I've gripped a gun inside that bag and I'm gripping it on my print. And they conducted test panorama and said, what a load of cops will look. Also, subsequently to that, we found out that the expert who gave me evidence for the Crown wasn't even qualified to do so. But if you're a jury member and you think... You're listening to the expert. You lived and you listen to the evidence that says there was a gun in the bag. Gun in the bag, you think, what's he doing gripping a gun in the bag? And the just, same gun that the deceased was killed with. Just those two things. I'm bollocks. You can't second guess what each jury member would have found. That's the point of law. It used to be called Pendleton. It's changed now. There's, a, there's one that's uh, uh, superseded that. Nonetheless, you cannot go back all those years and guess what each jury member would have made of that. That makes my conviction unsafe because it's it damaging. That. You're just that. But also, you've got to bear this in mind. Spackman stopped my solicitor after the first trial in the corridor and told him the split of the jury in the first trial. He said it was eight to four. Was it eight in my favour or eight against? However, what goes on in the jury room is sacrosanct. You're not meant to know. Everything stays in there. He knew as soon as they'd come back of a hung jury. Literally. Okay, yeah. Now, I've been told that's not an appeal oh. point either by the Criminal Cases Review Commission. But anyway, we're going to lodge my application to the CCRC based on the Panorama programme. Joel Bernal Benathan, who was my barrister, is now a judge. He worked for Tooks Chambers. He used to be Michael Mansfield's junior. Okay. Michael Mansfield was big in this day. He was the actual bee's knees. Mm. On camera, he turns around and says, it is a game changer. There we go. So I'm now going back to court based on the Panorama findings. The Forensic Institute of Science turned around and said no one can oppose their findings because they write the law in relation to this. So that's pretty much a win-win for me. Mm. Let's see what the Court of Appeal make. But let me give you a little bit more, Tommy. I got downgraded and chucked out of the prison system as a result of some paperwork that was sent <coughs> to my solicitor from an anonymous source. We went straight to the Court of Appeal with this paperwork. What paperwork was it? It was paperwork out of the police files. Okay. I was a bit concerned at the time because I thought they're going to make me back up to my wrist now. Because Danny McNamara, McAllister... Because you've got access to the police files? They were trying to say, how's he, how's he done this? Okay. And then Danny Mc, Mc, McAllister, who was a uh, prison director at the time, come up to see me. He was outside my cell. He used to be a governor at Whitemore. And he had bollock screws if they had done something wrong in front of you. And he would fight your corner. I liked him. A proper Scottish man's man. He was a big man and all. Fair! And I liked him, because there was a kick-off on the pitch one day, and everyone was cutting each other up and stabbing them and that. About 30 odd people was in the block. I got all A4 envelopes, recorded delivery, magazine, paperwork, stamps on and envelopes in there, recorded delivery stamps on and envelopes, they can write to their families and that in the rest of there. I wrote to 30 odd people so they could have contact with their family. Staff put them in the uh, store property. Didn't send them. He found out. They went kept down doing it nuts. He goes, get that fucking letters out of them boxes. But they let you know as well. So you sit and write a five, four page letter. And then you think you send it to your family, and it's like, oh, it's in store prop because it store said something. Prop. It's like some letter. And then you write another one, and it's back in store prop. That's all that. Store prop. So I didn't hear, from, but people were shouting to the lads, so they hadn't got my letter. So I went to Danny McAllister, and he went down the block, found out. So I liked him. But he come up to the, the, the long and short story is this. He come up to Franklin and said, Is that right? Well, I've heard about this paperwork. I said, It is. He said, Well, I've How did you get the paperwork? I didn't get it. Someone sent it. It was a police officer who sent it. And sent it to where? 
My solicitor. So, okay, so it's sent direct to your solicitor, okay. And, and that police officer done it anonymously. Anonymously. So then they went and searched for the paperwork. And then what happened was this, is that the police then conducted an investigation. The CPS instructed retired police officers from Hertfordshire again to go into the paperwork. Which were the police officers who worked with Speckman. 20 days after they went into these boxes where this paperwork came from, the coppers went back to the CPS and said there's a conflict of interest. I've worked with that police officer for a number of years on a number of cases. And the other police officer said he was schooled by him for two years. And how long did it take him to realise that? 20 days? 20 days. So they'd known that straight away. Straight away. As soon as they got it, they'd have known it, but they still had access to the papers. Yeah, and then the paperwork goes missing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've read it. Yeah. So this is the, t- the cover-up. So in the book there, that's why... That's where, can you, where can people buy this book? Only on Amazon now, because I've sold out. Okay, so they get this on Amazon, yeah? Yeah, Amazon. UK's Mr Shawshank, fitted up, fighting back. Fitted up and fighting back. Nick Hopkins named it that from The Guardian. He named it that? He's now the commanding, there's a CEO there. Okay. He runs The Guardian, Nick Hopkins. He was a journalist. He'd be a fan of mine then. Yeah, well, <laughs> Nick, well, do you know what? He's a, they're liberal, the guy, you know, you've got to have it, the left Yeah, but the, if they're true liberals and if they're true left-wing activists, then they, they truly want justice. He might be a fan of yours, I'll ask him. No, he's certainly not going to be a fan of mine. I'm not if he works for The Guardian or runs The Guardian. Well, you have to, I mean, you have to report respectively that you're going to have lefties and righties read that paper to some degree. Mm. Um, and it's, it's news, isn't it? And what news sells papers. Propaganda. Don't read what's in the But okay, so just some I want to get some more, just a little bit more on what it's like in that prison sentence. What's it like facing that sentence for something you haven't done with your family? Nine years not seeing your kids. What happened with your relationship with what was her name? The, the English Rose. What what happened <coughs> with your relationship with Kim? Well she her sister was married to a fella and Kim we was over, basically. Her mum said, listen, he's never coming over. Over when you went to jail? Yeah, did she that stood by me. Did that break your heart? Yeah, killed me. Broke my heart. Broke my fucking heart. What's, what's that like for people? Is oh, because people? everything's intensified in the unit. In yeah. the unit, it's, even in prison, it's In intensified. prison, everything's intensified. Small things are big things. You're sitting there, you're looking at a wall behind your door. No TV. I didn't have a telly. I said, you can keep your TV. I said, watch telly when I go home. Mm. So I'm sitting there looking at a wall or writing. And then it's controlled, you're contained. You think, God, oh, you can't do nothing. You can't go out for a walk in the field. You can't go and play tennis. You can't go down the road and have a pub. You can't do none of that. You are just locked in thinking that your bird's out there getting shagged by someone. Yeah, yeah, that's reality. Okay? That's reality, okay? Yeah. And someone's bringing up your kids. Your kids that you should be bringing up, that you didn't have a dad because your dad uh, split up with your mum and then your dad died years later. Um, and that is hard. Uh, it's very difficult for me. And then she met someone, one man, and still married to him today, John. A good man. That's, a, that's, a, what, what, I was ask, that's what would matter. Was he a good man? Good man, good, good, good to, to my children. boys. Yeah, yeah. One of my boys rebelled because you, you, you get that. Of course. Fighting for your dad's corner. But uh, yeah, he was good, a good man. Does still break uh, your heart now? Thinking about it now? Thinking about what your life could have been, should have been? He, he, I don't think of it like that. I try not to, because life shuffles the cards and we play. You've got to play with the best angel dealt, Tom, ain't you? And remember, Pat Purcell says to me, Kevin, do not get bitter, because it will change your personality. And I thought, do you know what? He said, you've got to make a life for yourself in here. I thought, fuck me, you're right, so I did. And I was always happy anyway, Tommy. I come out of the stairs, I was happy, look, oh, lucky, I like to have a laugh. It's my nature, I just love to have a laugh. That's environment. Got me through it. I used to get pissed, train, and have a laugh. And that was it, really. Um, but very difficult still, because I met a girl in there, Christian, she's in the book, she was from Potton, and she got killed in a car crash. And that broke my heart. Because I, I knew... Because like, like, lots of... When people been in prison, there's lots of girls that write to lads in prison. Oh, Start relationships, loads. loads of them. So yeah. loads of lads get into relationships with but I knew Christian women. before I went away from oh, okay. Potton, you see. Okay. So Kim separated with me, Christian started writing to me in there, come to visit me. And then she was a bit of an odd bod. She was like uh, dyslexic with dyslexic in her behaviour. So always an odd bod like that as a yeah, kid. Yeah. And then grows up into be a beautiful swan. Mm. She was the best shot at cadets. <laughs> and she could run six minute miles and become an aerobic teacher based on memory, not what she could read and write. And she got 90 or something percent in her exams. And used to teach aerobics in a little village hall. She was happy with that, mm. okay? So, I remember going to the phone to phone and she goes, I'm on the way to my mum's phone, we want to get to my mum's. She only had one mate and she used to go out of her family, that was it really. I phoned her auntie 
her mum's going to say, no answer, no answer, no answer. And on the phone again, her mum picked the phone up, her stepmum, she goes, Kevin, you've got to call me back to the police with the door, put the phone down, got locked up. Went back to my cell, thought, oh, what's going on here? Went to sleep, and I remember in the evening, I remember I thought I was having a dream, as if someone had laid into me. Now, you can't make this stuff up. You can't make it up, all right? And I remember someone landing to me like a, a, an outline of a body, like a chalk line, dead line, you know, on the floor. Mm. I sat bolt upright, and I was sweating. Made myself a hot chocolate, sitting there. I went straight out the door, got on the phone in the morning, uh, and I mum said, Kevin, I've got something to say. He said, Christian's dead. And I'd had a dream that she had laid into me that night. So she believed in, she used to go down the church and sit in the graveyard and in the summer and sit in the church, see all the lights coming through and things like that. Yeah, and she got killed. Now, I don't believe in God, and I'll tell you why I don't believe in God. I believe in something, but I don't know what it is. Because no, I don't know anyone who's been around long enough to tell us how this planet started and how we started. Why have they got UFOs in the pyramids and why have they got inscriptions on stone 600 years before the Bible and the Quran that says UFOs? And why are the, uh, 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 the, the American government reporting on UFOs and saying we've got to tell the public that they were meant to come out last year? And no, tell they're, just, they're just letting us know because they're going to. Stage an alien invasion, man. Well, say, there's got to be someone around. I've gone down the rabbit, rabbit hole. Rabbit hole. <laughs> I've gone down it. But you know what I mean, Tommy. Well, you mean, there's got to be something, I believe. There's a higher power than us. There's a higher power than us. So until I meet someone who knows a bit more about it than we do or what we're being fed, I don't know who I follow. But I believe in something or someone. That's a fact. I do. I believe in spirits. I believe in so ghosts. What do you believe happened there in that night? I believe that she got killed and come and laid into me. Uh, and I think she's been with me ever since. It's quite bizarre, really. So that was a hard knock to take. How hard? It broke, I was crying my eyes out. Because I, I couldn't look it, at another when you, woman. When you're stuck in four walls, and that would have been, I'm guessing, how many years into your sentence was this? I, I was t six years. Six years, so that's probably the person you speak to every day. Yeah. And, then, and then she's gone. So gone. That's, a, that's another loss. Gone. And she was so sweet, always happy. Oh, Never lost, no visits. So you've lost your old woman with your kids, then you've, uh, met you've met someone else, and she was never going to leave me. She said, I've loved you from the moment I've seen you, and now I've got you, I'm never going to let you go, is what she said to me. Which is very comforting for someone who's sitting in the cell as well. Doing a big lump of bird. You're doing a big bird, you know you've got someone. And then she's gone. And then she's gone. And I thought, I am not having another bird now, I'm going to do my time on my own. But then I ended up going into another relationship quite a few years later, actually, mm. quite by chance. Um, and you could have had relationships, so I was getting lots of letters all the Probably time. doing better with birds in there than some people were doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was actually, that's the truth of the matter, I mean, God. I was getting 250 Christmas cards a year. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> oh, Scrooge said, you're getting more Christmas cards than Charlie Bronson. I can't believe that, but that's what he said to me. <laughs> and uh, maybe I did, but... Uh, what about Mum? Mum's alive, she lives in uh, Bletchley. Oh, she lives just up in Bletchley? Just up in Bletchley, not far from here. Okay, she always been from Bletchley? No, no Brentford. Okay. From where? Brentford. Brentford, okay. Brentford. What, what was all this like with your mum, for your mum? Did your mum, did your mum always believe your innocence? Yeah, did yeah, your mum always innocent. fight for your innocence? Well, my mum's, they've had people, mum, my mother's had people tell her about the murder and who did it yeah. before I ever did. And as a result of, if you live in an area, it's pretty mm. common knowledge you did it. Yeah, 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 everyone knows of them. So when I went to prison, a lot of people said he never done the murder. We know he did do the murder. Mm. So you've got Screws being told that. Screws saying... Because if anyone knows, it's the, cri the criminals know. Criminals. So they knew I was innocent, and I know I was doing a lot of birds. So I had a lot of support from people in the prison system. Do you think... Do you think sitting here now, your name will be cleared? Yeah, I do. I, I, I really do. How old's Mum? 70-odd now. Right, do I hope it's, I hope it's in time that she sees it? Yeah, she will. Because um, like... it must be devastating for a mother to have her son's name dragged through the mud like this, a murderer, as a murderer. Yeah. Do you know what's ironic, though, Tommy, is that I did a podcast with Lewis Raymond Taylor, and he said, the nicest convicted murderer you'll ever meet. You said that you? <laughs> yeah, that was the title, <laughs> was it? Yeah, and I love that, because <laughs> you know, when people meet me and they don't know me, and then they find out about me, they go, no, you're, you're kidding, never. And the screws would sort of say, Lane's good for morale. That's four years. He's good for morale, he's good for the landings, he doesn't suffer falls easily. Um, they said a few other things about me as well. Mm. But uh, I was good for the landings. And I, I know that I was liked by black, white, yellow, brown. If your heart's good for me, then you'll do for me. If you're an arsehole and you're bad, then I don't want fuck all to do with you. Mm. And that's my, my motto. And then 
when you live in close quarters with people who will die for you in there or die with you, mm. there's a bit of a difference to it that time, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Big difference, because you're in the trenches with you. Yeah, yeah, of course. And uh, I've you're seen some real worried. bizarre things happen in there. Real bizarre things. Look, do you remember the Glasgow bomber who drove a car into the car? The doctor. Petrol, the, the doctor, doctor. Yep. right? He's in that book. Terry Conaghan got done for shooting Francis, the boxing trainer. Okay, yeah, he got done with the Black Kids in London. Right, uh, jump up, uh, Johnny Flynn did it, jump up John. From outside the pub? Outside no. his yard. Oh, was outside right. his yard. But Terry Conaghan got found guilty of that with John Flynn, jump up John, like I say, used to call him. And he had bad asthma, and he was having a massive attack, and this, this, he's waiting half an hour, and the screws, the healthcare still hasn't come up to him, which is a long time, and he's choking for oxygen. I haven't got the fucking Dr. Death, didn't I? Dr. Death. <laughs> I went straight around and said, I need you. Yeah. My mate needs you. And fair play, he come fucking running, right? And uh, screw has gone right bang up because I'm banging up. And he's fucking giving him aid and trying to do this and do that to him and calm him down and doing what he's doing. He said, I, don't, I am not leaving this man. But Terry's face when I brought in Dr. Death, his attack worsened. <laughs> <laughs> He's a little jihadi. You fucking, this bastard <laughs> trying to kill me and my fucking countrymen. He weren't talking, but I knew that's what his eyes were saying. He's looking at me saying, Kevin, what are you fucking doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Strange, Tommy. Yeah. You know, but in the next breath, he'd be tipping oil over someone's bloody head. Wanting to burn them. Fucking burn them, you know. It's like that carry on. Unsuccessful. Strange. Strange. Unsuccessful jihad. He drove into Scotland Airport, blew himself up, didn't he? Blew himself, burnt all his legs. Got dragged out and punched up by some random Scottish lads. Stashed to bits. <laughs> and then they come to prison. And they put these people on the landings. And wonder, so you're faced with thinking, what, well, I should be bashing these bastards up. Some lads did. Um, they run it now, don't they? Um, they do to a degree, yeah. Depend on where. Yeah, and they can't run it where there's stuff. Yeah, I know, here's something. If you make a stand and you are a dominant force in the prison system where you will not have them bastards on the landings because they're converting people, forcing people to convert, you are now held in the segregation of the blocks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the lads ain't getting that out of segregation. So anyone who's made a resistance against his, the, the spread of Islam in the prison, the Piranha Boys or the, the Scouse lads. Scouse lads. The Scouse lads. Yeah, all, they're Will, all, yeah, Will Caswell is yeah, one of them. They're riding block. They haven't seen daylight. Block to block to block, block to block, block to block, block. Because they're a resistance to the spread of Islam. So you want to cook bacon in the kitchen? Not a fucking chance if you've got a load of Muslims on the yeah, window that, that are terrorists. So the system are allowing them to take over the jails by any resist, any English, so people understand what's happening. There is a there is a slight English resistance to the prison system in the gang format. The Islamic gangs are dominating the prison. There was a, a load of Scouse lads from Liverpool who started standing up to it. They've now been blocked off totally. Yeah, and they're, a, a they're lot getting of other tortured lads as well. And, and other lads. But let's be fair though, just not just sing, segregate that down to Muslims yeah. because there's lads in there. I've got a pal, right? Do we? He's uh, black Jamaican. Yeah. He converted way before any of this bollocks mm. for the for the religion side of it. Okay. So there's good in the job. I mean, he's a black white man, do he? You know, he's like I should. He would literally he, he, he mm. proper. And there's lots of lads in the system like that, as you know, Tom. Yeah, people right? need something to help them. Me, so if, they're if out, it benefits right? them. But they're not interested in all that terrorism shit. Yeah. All they want to do is just get on with their bird. Mm. So there is good and bad, as we both know. So we don't want to get into that conversation no, no, that's now. My thing, it's all it? bollocks, but not all bollocks. But for this conversation, yeah, yeah. it's not right. So they're being affected as well because they're then being forced to do stuff they don't want to do. Yeah, yeah, they're being influenced. And they're being told do it or you're going to get stabbed. Yeah. Oof, you know, really, I'm only doing a bit of, bit of bird here for whatever. Yeah. Why don't I get involved in all this madness for? Because you've, whatever reason, so very difficult times. But if you've got a category A uh, review coming up, you're looking at these bastards thinking you're tipping all over people's heads, you're doing this, you're doing that. I go and get stuck into you now, I ain't going home. So it got to the stage now in my sentence where they said Lane uses violence to, as a method of means. Even unproven ones, even unproven adjudications. Yeah, they still keep it on the internet. Still put it in there, as in you're just not going home, at all. Yeah. So when, I, when that paperwork come to light that my, my solicitor received, I was downgraded and chucked out of the prison system. And I remember a screw coming up to me, a security screw, and he never used to come on the land because he was hated. He said, I don't know what you've done, he says, but written on your file that says, you're not to be released to you, you're old or dead. Very old is what he said, and dead. I went, yeah, I'm going home, see you later. 
And all, and that's it, all fucking out the door. Well, that's when you were getting released? Got released from D- uh, Cat A, down to B Cat. OK, down to B Cat, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then I never forgot it, unless you do you And then you work in the system to get home? Well, they got me out of the prison system, and as soon as I got me out of the prison you, system... You call it getting out of the prison system, getting out of ACAT? ACAT. So you, you take ACAT as a prison system? I call it as a Cat A system, yeah. Yeah, yeah, OK. So... Category A is the most maximum security prison system, so it's where all the most serious offenders are. It's where you've got least least freedom. Least freedom. And it's heavy. Heavy. We're and as you go down, then you get B cap, where you start getting a bit more freedom. Then you get C cap, where you can, and then eventually you start you going out working. And I went to Blantyre House. When I got there, they left me on the bus. Yeah, it's yeah. D cap now. It's immigration centre now. Okay. But I went there. Good prison. It was best in the country at the time. So I went there. Uh, kept on a bus an hour. All the others were taken off. The governor said, I'm not having him. I said, what have I done? I've been made a DCAT. He said, we're not having him. That's no, a reputation, bro. Cl- that was a closed prison. Open DCAT. Unbelievable. So when I got out eventually, from the, when the paperwork first come to light, it took four years for it to come to court. When the paperwork that the police officer sent in that proved questioned your yes. sentence and questioned the evidence yes, yes. a police officer said a police officer's got access to a police officer knows what's happened knows it's wrong he's access to paperwork and he sent it to your lawyers saying here you go yeah that's exactly what happened that should have been enough really to, out the door to out the door but it took you four years to get into court and when i got into court law yeah. chief justice hughes stepped down and i wrote to law chief Justice, not went to write to judges and i wrote to him i said you need to be aware of this 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 and this before you consider my case because i don't believe you are aware of it he stepped down who stepped in? Lord Chief Justice Rafferty. Lord Chief Justice Rafferty was sitting at the bedside of the prosecutor who uh, prosecuted me in the hospice when he got killed. He died four months after my conviction. Something like that. He died a very quick period of time. He had a big tumour on his head and in his face and that. And they set up a trust called the Callisher Trust. The Callisher Trust pays for trainee barristers uh, for their career. I was only working in the CCRC doing their training. So every time my conviction was going into the CCRC, the Criminal Cases Review Commission, mm. you got trainee barristers looking at my fucking paperwork, paid for by the Callister Trust. So two weeks before I go up on appeal, Hughes steps out, Rafferty steps in. See you later. Spanish Archer, the elbow, sent me fucking down the road. Did you, how didn't you give up your fight for justice? I never give up. How? When you, cause you it's must, in me not to give up. Because you must have hit so many setbacks in that time. Yeah, you And not just so many setbacks, so, many blat- so much blatant, wrongful actions, corruption, where you're thinking, how, how, how are you ever going to prove this? That's the, oh, if, I without the police officers coming forward, see, this adds a lot of weight, doesn't it? A lot of weight. There's a lot of stuff in that book, and when you read it, you're going to know. My, my, not motto, but my thought pattern was, it can only get better. It can only get better, Kevin. Don't worry, it can only get better. And that's all I say to myself pretty much in life. And if it's, something bad happens, I say, well, what's the positive in this? What's the, well, it means, so I'm in the segregation. It means, well, I'm going to lose a bit of weight. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> what I've waited to I'm lose a bit of weight. I'm going to have, <laughs> sol- have a bit of solitary confinement. I'm going to have a bit of fort time on my own. I'm going to be sterile down here for a while. And I'll think of it like that. I'll find something in it positive to focus on. It's a good way to get through life. You have to, because you focus on the negative. You're fucked. You're fucked. Which is what they want. That's what they want. That's what the system's all about, especially these boxes. And, and I will never give up, me. Never. And it's in me, whatever I do, I say, I ain't going to give up. And I thought, I've got to take the fight to them. I'm in the belly of the beast here. I'm in a very deep hole and I've got to climb out. So every time I sent a letter out, and I sent over 10,000 letters and folders and... CDs with news buttons on me and all sorts of bits and pieces. So you might get a folder from A to Z. It'll be Enclosure 1 and I'll explain what Enclosure 1 is and Enclosure 2, etc, etc. And then... Uh, I suppose it give you something to focus on as well. Focus, uh, focus I suppose it give you something to focus on to get through your bird. To get through your bird. It's give you a total focus. I mean, if you're not worried about... Your, you know, if you, you, You're probably worried about getting an air cut because there was no barbers in the prison who was qualified to cut your hair. Thank you, Adam Swells from Swells Barbers for cutting my hair. You made me look very smart for today. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm Adam. feeling done, but I'm Adam. <laughs> but you had things like silly things that you couldn't even get your hair cut. You had to shave your head when it was in the unit. You wouldn't have a barber. They wouldn't let a barber in. Yeah. Why should you have to go through bollocks like that? So you're thinking about madness distracting you. So the book and fighting my case, uh, uh, Joel Benathan told me to write the book. And then by writing the book, Joel Benathan. Who's that? QC. 
He was okay. my barrister. He said, you need to write a book, Kevin. He said, because your book's going to make, make a fantastic reading. So then... Make a fantastic paper, film. The Lennox Brothers have already written the film. So the Lennox Brothers do movies, music movies. They've written a the film. And that book is coming... On this? Yeah, with that. It's with New Amsterdam. Now, here's something. So... As you know, I've done Banged Up, just flipping it a bit. I've done quite a bit of TV recently, and I've got other TV stuff coming up. Through that, my LinkedIn has gone nuts. Last week, I had Paramount Pictures and Sony Pictures view my profile twice in one week. I've had over 300 requests from... Uh, I, I really do hope that the, the injustice of it gets the recognition. Uh, and not just the recognition, but the people who conspired to fit you up are brought to justice. Right, well in the prison system now they've been ostracised. Now the film and all that, that is not about, oh I'm having a film, I'm having a film. In the name of the father, got nine Oscars. Mm. What a film? In the name of the father, but the IRA boys. Yeah, what, a what a film. Sorry, what yeah, a film, sorry, yeah, I thought you said what a film, sorry. Yeah, what what a, film. a film, brilliant film. What a film. So I want that, I've always knew, or, or I had a belief that my case was so unbelievable, outrageous, outrageous or at the highest levels, that it would make a film one day. And now the book has been so well received, and then the book and the, and the TV, that is going to be on the TV at some point. Now let's feel by this in mind. You're fighting a system. You have one barrister, one junior, and a solicitor to represent yourself. Yet you've got a whole criminal uh, crime prosecution service, a whole police service, prison service, government. against you and the government. A massive wealth of... Uh, uh, resources. No, I know the feeling. You know them, so <laughs> you're fighting, battling uphill. But I've got help. Because my trainer used to say to me, John Scott, he said, keep throwing them punches, Kevin. Throw 100 punches. He said, you only need one, one to land. land. I thought, well, I don't want to throw 100 punches and miss 99 times. But every time I sent a, a letter out, I thought, I'm one step nearer to getting home. Send that punch out, one step nearer to getting home. And that's what I did. Another letter, another letter, another letter, another letter. And that's how I did it. I thought like I was throwing punches back home. So when I got a reply out of 100 letters or whatever, I thought, well, that's one step nearer. Tell me when you got out of jail. What year did you get out? Nine, uh, 1995, January. So I spent 20 years in the 15th of January. To go out in 2015. And then what? Because you've said you went on to set up a business. What, well, you, come out of biz you come out of that age, you're how old? Oh, I was 47. With nothing? Nothing. Nowhere to go? Yeah, hey, like I asked for a flat. This is you ain't getting a flat. You have, you have got the resources not to be sleeping on someone's floor. Cheeky bastard. So 20 years later, you've still got the resources, I believe. I had a bit of money, but not a lot. Okay. Nothing. You know, I had a few grand left. Some pals mm. gave me some money. I went to live with Matthew Tate. Matthew Tate was just, about the last year, he used to be a Bram Rich's personal bodyguard. Okay. He was working for them. Uh, we boxed together. I'm godparent to Fio, Fio, Fio Rolo, his daughter. Um, I went to live with, stay with him, and then I went to... Uh, I moved in with an Italian girl called Liliana, lovely girl, um, and then I got my own place. And then from that, I set up a business called Tommy Cooper's, because my real name's Cooper. Uh, my father's name is Cooper. Tommy Cooper's Developments. We build it just like that, leave you a smile. And they loved it, because you're dealing with people who remember Tommy Cooper. Yeah. That went through the roof. Doing what? Building? Building. I went from doing patios, block paving, to having carpenters and building houses. And Which is mad, because you've got none of those skills. I'm a carpenter, but I'm a okay. shit one. Okay. I did my apprenticeship and then jacked that in and went and did sold cars and stuff like that, okay. and went into sales. Um, but I thought, I, were, I had one Sunday off a, 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 in a month. So you were at it? At it, working on it, hard. Hungry. Working on it, and one, after a year, I bought a 50 grand Mercedes AMG from Mercedes brand new, had imported from Spain. Mate, come out of jail with nothing. Come out of nothing, got that. I was earning ten and a half grand a month, ten grand a month, paying myself decent wage, all expenses as well on top of that. Uh, then COVID came in, then I got recalled, then I went back to prison for a common assault against me, my ex girlfriend. I threw her, she was uh, scratching and kicking my car, pissed one night. Uh, she had a lot of problems, bless her, you know, with her mum having a stroke and whatever happened anyway. Four occasions I've put my arms around her and put her indoors. The fifth occasion, I've got out of my car again where she's ripped the number plates out and like I say, scratching it with keys and punching it. Still didn't do nothing. And I finally found my keys in her freezer. About six in the morning, 6.30. <coughs> the morning. As I'm driving off, I've seen her. This is in Ascot High Street, West Ascot High Street. She's walking in the high street with <coughs> the cars down with no knickers, no bra or a shirt on. Pissed as a new, right? I reversed back up. As I walked towards her, she's going to give me a lot. I've grabbed her by the back of the fucking neck, ear, the shirt. 
And I went, oh, fuck off, and I threw her. I went to prison for common assault, Make regardless cool. of what she'd done. It's all on video. <coughs> Ridiculous. It's all on video, because they said I lost control of my emotions. Any other man that's been held captive had the abuse that I went through, because when the old bull went around to on the body cam, she's calling them C-U-N-T's and everything. None of that meant, any, meant anything. Because I'm an ex-lifer, they said I lost control of my emotions, Silly. you need to go back to prison and do another course. Yeah, and you've got to wait for your course and go through the system. How long did you do on that? Eighteen and a half months. Eight, eight. Eighteen and a half months. But what? not even a custodial sentence. If you weren't a lifer, you'd have just done 28 day recall. Damn, been out. Yeah. For a non-custodial offence. I come on a soul, it's not even custodial. Custodial. Because you're a lifer, bloody hell. Because I'm a lifer. So I went back for 14 and a half months, got out for two months, and they recalled me again for another four. four? And uh, wrongful reporting. Police, the probation service got, some of them were sacked, and they, got, uh, they were reporting on me wrongfully. And at the time they recalled me, I now know why, because they're investigating me for another murder, that my co-defendant told him I'd done. He told him I'd done another three murders. So when I got a hung jury on the first trial, there was three police forces waiting to dock arrest me, down to information that he gave. Now I turn around and say this, why don't you go and ask him about these murders if he knows so much about them? Let's just get back on to him, you know, for a second. So in 2000, you, this is in 1994, yep. and in 2005 was it? 2004, this same gentleman, Vincent. 2002. 2002 goes on arrested. to shoot, okay, got arrested, goes on to shoot Dave King in Hoddesdon. So the man that was your co-defendant is then arrested for another murder. When you're hearing that in jail, what are you thinking there? I thought, I can't wait to see him. Because <laughs> <laughs> by then- Because he's in the system now. In the system, and you know that little asshole done? In the unit, it's like a porter cabin. Cells on both sides. And the phone's over there. He was on the phone. Are you with him? No, but the lads, other lads are in there. They, right. he, he was, he wouldn't come nowhere in the yeah. prison I was in. But he shot his solicitor on the phone. You got a right to the home office? You can't have them send me to uh, Whitemore where Kevin Lane is? Then the governor's come in on the landing in front of the cons. He was that panicky. They called him the jittery one because his legs are always going, all right? Obviously, because he can't keep his fucking mouth shut. He's got no bollocks or anything. Mm. And he throws other people in. He got someone else a life sentence, by the way, and all. In fact, 19 years, uh, Brian Donnellan. So he's gone up to the governor in the unit and he said, you can't send me to Whitemore, Kevin Lane's there. And he's doing it in front of other cons. Giving him gold watches because he had a few quid by then. Mm. Yeah. And then he came into the system. I got called into the office in Whitemore and said, if anything happens to Roger Vincent, it's going to affect your cut A because we know where it's come from. I've said his name again now. You've got to have to edit Yeah, we'll be right? down. We'll Sorry, be down. so... Uh, okay. We know where it's come from, and I'm thinking, you know what? Well, for, uh, poetic justice, I could have had him done loads of times. Mm. People say to me, he's here, Kevin, do you want anything done? I went, no, 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 leave. And then he's getting, he's getting his chest out, he's got a fucking, he's wrapping himself around a few terrorists. All right? And I went to one called Marcus Johnson. He was like a main face in the system. He, whatever, he's still doing it, whatever, he, you know, anyway. Yeah. So he landed in Franklin. And that's why I beat up Gary Nelson. So he was like their black godfather in the prison system. Mm. And I moved wings. And first of all, I go back to Marcus Johnson. So I've gone round to myself, I knocked on his door, I said, you know where I am, I know where you are. I said, your mate's no good. I said, I said, I don't come down to offend you, but your mate's no good. And I'm telling you now, because if it comes out later on that something's happened and I haven't told you, you can say, fuck, take it, Kevin. What happens? He gets done or his old woman's done for buying machine guns that my co-defendant had arranged. Oh. Oh. All right, so there's set him up. Set him up. So Gary Nelson had got done for shooting PC uh, done. He shot a doorman on his doorstep, and then the copper come out of the house a few doors up, got on a push bike, and he shot him and all. He got tried for that, acquitted, and he got double jeopardy tried again. My co-defendant is godparents to his kid and vice versa. So when he's come into the system, I'm thinking, well, you think Nelson can protect you? So I'm with my uncle Pat Purcell, or through marriage that is, my uh, Kim's uncle, and some white good pals of mine, close pals, we managed to get together. In Whitemore? In Whitemore, on the same landing, good food boat, good crack, good company. I moved wings, because Nelson played on the same team as me. So I needed to play on the opposite team, didn't I? So I moved wings and went over with Tommy Mullins. Tommy Mullins is a well-known Irishman boxer, he now lives in uh, uh, Morocco. Can't come back to this country. I went and lived over with Tommy, Did right? he do the money one? No, 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 and okay. um, 
I moved wings so I could mark Nelson to, to have a row with him on the football pitch. So it's sport, not it's okay. a different type of nicking, isn't it? Okay. And uh, I started taking liberties with him on the football pitch. I dove, throw, dive through the air. And this is the gospel, like fucking Superman. <laughs> got, <laughs> got him round the throat. <laughs> Jumped up and he's gone, well, if you can't let him do that, he could have broke my neck and all the rest of it. Nothing. Did a few, and he's, but fair, but he had to go back. He's given me a right kick on one of the tackles. Mm. Fucking hell, I know he did, bastard. But like, so we both went for the ball, but he kicked me. So then I'm marking him, and he's backing, in, backing into me, and he's turned around and tried to hit me. I think bang, 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 I hit him a number of times. Mm. He's gone over, the lad's jumped on me, he's got up, walked around the side, hit me, knocked me over, I've stumbled, got up. We've both got sent off, they took him off, and they took me off. Tony Daniels, or Super, who's his nickname, he's black Tony, right? Mm. right. He like, talks like a white cockney, he does, right? He's out in the yard, he's gone, fucking hell, mate. He's gone, oh, I'm black, he goes, but I can see his fucking bruises. <laughs> you see his bruises? <laughs> <laughs> he goes, his lips are like rubber dingies. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's a black man talking about another yeah, black yeah, man, yeah, right? Yeah. And he's like, but he... I what? was going to make a comment before, I better not. Why can't you just say <laughs> things that are funny? And, no, you know, no. and just no awful, because that's the black man saying yeah, it about yeah. a black man, and we're laughing about yeah. it. I said, go and get him out, I want to talk to him. Because Pat Purcell says to me, you're out of order, Kevin. You set about him just to send a record message back to, the, to the, my co-defendant. I went, yeah, I did. He goes, well, you're wrong, Kevin. You shouldn't have done that. You don't have to apologise to him. And I ain't apologising to him. He said, well, if you want to do the right thing, and admit, he said, you know, make a better man of you. So I got hold of the super, get him out. He come out. He's going, you was out of order. I said, yeah, I know I was. He goes, well, apologise then. I went, I apologise. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at you now with dark glasses on, all right? Your lips swollen out here. <laughs> you're I'm fucking all, you got, I know you've got black eyes under yeah, there, yeah, yeah. all right? And your face is all swollen, all right? I thought, yeah, I can apologise to you because I ain't a mark on me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's it. But, do you know what, I was, do you know what I'm saying? you thinking is, do you know why you massively need this acquittal? Because you're going to hit someone else or something. <laughs> <laughs> and as a lifer, you're going to go straight oh, back to jail. Someone I should be laughing, but... It, 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 it's it, true. It, <laughs> I call it bad behaviour. Someone tried to mug me from a watch. I was, come, I was in Sexy Fish with some pals of mine, yeah. Perry Worry, Ronnie Parry, Darren Woods and, and Perry's boy. And I was walking, we'd been to Charlie Bronson's art exhibition and I had a, I had a 12 and a half grand suit on and a cashmere camel skin, right? I looked the bollocks. And then, <laughs> <laughs> I looked like a banker. So this geezer's shouting at me with two geezers near him and a bird. And they're shouting, they're shouting as we're getting closer. I thought, this is apparently shouting at me. So as I got closer up to him, you've insulted my bird and all the rest of it. And I said, she's there, the girl. And I said, love, I said, I've been in Sexy Fish all afternoon. I've been in an art exhibition. I didn't say Charlie Bontons. So I've been in an art exhibition in Shoreditch. I said, I've never seen you before in my life. She said, no, I've never seen you before, love. I've gone, see, mate, you've made a terrible mistake. And he's still giving it, giving it some. And I thought, ah, oh, bollocks, you must have had a drink or you've had fucking too much sniff. I was like that. Huh? Yeah, nice watch. So I thought he'd have sank up his nose or something. As I turned around, he goes, I'm going to stab you. I'm going to fucking kill you, he says. I'm going to stab you. I thought, you ain't stabbing me in the back. So I said, listen, mate, you are not stabbing me in the back. Make that quite clear now. Anyway, he's come for me. I've given him a dig in defence. His mates, birds jumped on me, should I say. He's walked got up, walked around the side, give me the biggest haymaker. Fractured my jaw, broke my eye socket, this eye's all blurred, you're blurred in this eye. Mm. Uh, fractured my nose, G blood gushing out of my nose, gushing out of it, literally. I was lago and all, to be fair, I've been on the drink all day. And I was, I was trying to stop the bleeding, I said, you fucking wait there till I stop this bleeding. Stop the bleeding, I said, right, well, I want to talk to you now. He run. Now, I would get recalled for that, they call that bad behaviour. Yeah, yeah, you, know, you don't have to, like, you know, I've got a stupid recall. And someone threatened to rape my mum, and I replied saying, they said, I said, they said, we're coming looking for your mum, basically. Like, oh, this is on yeah, Twitter. Yeah, and literally. I said, don't need to look for me, I'll meet you tomorrow. Where, where I was going, I said, I'll be here at one o'clock. I got recalled. Liberty. I got recalled. Now, yeah. you, that, you think that that was on camera, what happened to me. Yeah. Why didn't any police come to turn up? Not one copper come yeah. down there. I, don't, I mean, that's just... Probably yeah. luck of the jaw. Probably just London, they're all... Probably busy, but the fact, it just shows how you've been doing no... I won't go to no marches. Yeah, it shows you? how you could be walking down the street and bang. So I'll come to... Uh, yeah, you need to get acquitted, bruv. Get acquitted. <laughs> Badly. <laughs> you really need to get really, acquitted. Really, I've got people... Because that, what's that like? What, what's that like as well? Say you're here now. 
What's it like walking? You, as a lifer, you're walking with that over your head. I don't go certain places where I think there might be trouble. One bit of trouble, you're gone. I avoid it like the VD. I don't want to get it. Yeah. I won't go to Save the Planet March. In case I come out of one street, I'm in the front of a march. I'm getting pushed into uh, police yeah, you constantly from behind. Be the next thing you know, you're nicked. You must constantly be on edge. Oh, I think, oh, I don't go there. I'm not going there. There could be trouble there. Or I won't go to certain... Well, I'll go to any football match now if I want to go, but I don't. I went to Arsenal the other day, actually, because as a guest, but... Mm. Yeah, it's very, very difficult. Very difficult, because you're just trying to lead a straight life, keep your head down, see your son, lead a, law, lead a law abiding life. And that's what I try to do. I give out charity work on a Monday, I've been doing that for two years. Do you have a good relationship with your kids? Yeah, yeah. they find it difficult, of course. Um, but like, so, for instance, I'm owed a lot of money um, by a fellow called Andrew Andrews. If anybody's got any information about him, leave it on my website for me, please, or my fit up and fighting back. He owes me 260 grand. He got nicked for 15 counts of fraud. He took money off a lady who had cancer for a shed in the back garden. Is he a car player? No. no okay. He's an ex football player. He used to play for um, uh, up in March, a, town, a little football team up there. But Andrew Chatters or Andrew Andrews, he got, he'd done something with uh, Katie Price, had her over and all. So he got nicked for all of that. And yet he owes me money, signed in the solicitors and everything, sticks two fingers up me and calls the police on me when I go to his house. Of course, because you'll, you'll go life. Convicted contract killer's been at my house. And you can't even go after And you it. think, what is going on here? Yeah, you're a convicted contract killer. Convicted contract still killer. Still are now, sitting here. Two fingers up at me all the time. Yeah, you don't have to pay you, because you'll go straight to jail. Straight and to prison. Him. Well, he will do, because I'm putting legal debt collectors on him now. Yeah, yeah. So we can seize possessions of what he's got in his name and things like that. So I'm having to go with that, but it's a long process. What's the, uh, what's the future for you, Kev? I'll have a few more kids. Yeah? Well, you've got to keep practicing, isn't you? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll have a few more. <laughs> I want someone to visit me when I get older. <laughs> so I'll have a few more kids. <laughs> but I'm practicing a lot in a minute, I've got to tell you. <laughs> I'll get, I've been offered, listen, I ain't going to go into it. I'm not going to, but I've had a, a message today. If I showed you my phone, it's ridiculous. I've been invited to a swingers party. Right. <laughs> Two sisters, uh, the mum, which I'm not keen about. about. I said the mum as well. That's a bit seedy, isn't it? All right, but the mum. Let me see pictures. And their mates and all the rest of it. I thought, oh no, no, you can't let <laughs> you can't let your cock roll your brain there. But I do very well. I was out last night with Ashley, you know, off of her big brother. Yeah, she's a lovely girl. I like a good laugh, knows to score and all the rest of didn't it. Didn't meet her at a swingers she went party. Mike Tyson, didn't she? Didn't meet her at a swingers party. No, I didn't. No, <laughs> fuck it. Now she's no, not, no. I shouldn't say that. Now. She's not like that. But no, I met a few. I've been to swingers parties. <laughs> I nearly went to the. Uh, Mate, you've done twenty four years. I went went down those swingers parties. I nearly enjoy went yourself. To torture, uh, torture chambers the other week. Yeah, I was, I was going to go there. You ever heard of it? No, no, no. Look it up. Get in there. <laughs> <laughs> right, you don't like the old mask where you put the mask on. You just on. want to go back to jail. Well, okay, that's what, I guess the torture chamber is a bit like being back in the back on the unit. Well, you, you bra- <laughs> <laughs> Except you've got loads of half naked women walking around. It's like a really good unit. <laughs> but the old pop dagger gets a bit of action in them. I've got to what you was dreaming about in the dreaming. unit. Dreaming. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to find myself a nice girl. And say, I mean, I've had some bleeding. I've had a few close shaves with some women, but um, now I'm single again. Mm. I just conduct myself respectfully and I go out of a girl, I say, look, let's just cut all the bullshit. I'm going to do, uh, Sheridan's, a girl called Sheridan, an Aussie girl, she, my son has horse riding lessons at her farm every two weeks and uh, he rides a, a well-known horse, I can't name the horse on here, but it's famous, this horse, and he has horse riding lessons on this horse. But she's going to interview me how to pull a bird, right? And she's going to ask me a load of questions, I'm going to put it up, right? Well, I don't go out to pull birds, I say, let's just have a good time Enjoy each other's company and see where it takes us. Let's focus on that instead of talking bollocks. Or go to the swingers club. Go to the swingers club. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't be saying that, Mum, if you're watching. <laughs> Kev, I've enjoyed the chat, man. Oh, it's been a good laugh. It's probably a bit in depth, but I hope the, the I audience... people get... But anyone who doesn't, who's interested in your story, can buy your book. And, um, and I guess follow where your story goes. Cause... And can I say, I've got an evening with Kevin Lane on the 23rd of February at Cambridge Country Club in Bourne. You've got Peter Fury, myself, Matt Legg and Kenny Collins attending. Matt Legg from Milton Keynes? Matt Legg from Milton Keynes, all right. So okay. Matt's a good friend of mine. He knocked that tooth out and I was sparring with him last really? year. Big bastard. Mate, if you, if, you, if you have a link to these tickets, I'll share them on my socials. Yeah, lovely. I'll Thank you. Yeah. And they started 40 quid. People were getting confused at the price of them. 40 quid up to 200, but it's sort of a meet and greet and a mingle. 
And that's in, in like I said, it's Palatial Country Club. It's going to be a great evening. Peter Fury, for instance, that's fair, right? I mean, yeah, I'm, 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 I bumped into him when I was doing a news podcast. I was doing a podcast recently in London. But you, um, hardest man I've ever been hit by, Peter, yeah. in terms of punching. He split a pair of gloves on me after <coughs> seven weeks. Mm. Spying with him. And what's this evening? Is, is, is this what you look? You think you could travel around doing these sorts of evenings, talking about your story? I've been. This I'm getting a fee for. Well, that. you were a good character, yeah, and you were a character as well. So people are going to thank you. People Thank are gonna, you. Gonna, it brings money in. I, you know, yeah. I haven't had a wage for two years. I built some houses. Wage, you didn't have a wage for 24 years, 24 bro. years. Which was on £10 a week in jail. £10 a week. Yeah, fifth, yeah, 15 quid. But quickly, I designed some houses when I got let, let out from recall. Mm. Uh, I had it designed and imported into this country within six months. Designed what? Uh, some houses that can be moved around on wheels. Yeah. But they're real houses that are mortgageable if they're into the concrete. Okay. But I've taken them off of concrete and put them on a superstructure chassis. So now people in mobiles and such and so on and so forth, and they've got real houses on wheels. So I can wheel them in on wheels under a law called portable and temporary. Take the wheels off, lower it onto DPC if I wish, or leave the wheels on and put skirting around it. And I designed these houses, converted a meadow, spent a lot of money on the meadow, converting it, it was just a meadow, put gates in it and roads and utilities and everything. And the lady that owns that meadow is 110 and she's dying. So the family are now contesting the wheel, I've been locked off it for a year. But they're now allowing me to take my houses off and I'm selling them. <coughs> uh, they're going down to Peter's site in, in Cornwall to be sold. So I'll be back in Quids Inn soon. But I've had a, a long two years without any wages, surviving on your wits and what your pals give you. Literally. You must have some good mates, mate. Very, they pay all my bills. I mean, literally, nine grand for this and seven grand for that and this grand and two grand. I need a bit more dollars, another grand. I'm very fortunate to have good people around me. But they know I'm a money getter. I'm rich you'll in equity, money. Cash, yeah. but poor in cash. Yeah, you'll make money. You'll I've got it. money sitting there mm. as soon as I sell it. And as soon as that arsehole gives me my 260 fucking odd grand. 255 euros, mm. actually. So, Kev. Pleasure. Good I've enjoyed pleasure. it. Thank I've you very much. You know what? Thank you so much for bringing uh, awareness to my conviction. Nah, cheers, bro. Honestly, it's been yeah, lovely. I've, I've enjoyed it, man. And, and your mum makes a lovely bit of cheese on toast. My mum does. <laughs> <laughs> She's a feeder, isn't she? Oh, she's you're a feeder. You'd have come in, she'd have been like, you're eating Lovely. It. Well, when you mentioned me, I said, I'm just having a bath. I know, but I, <laughs> I thought you was at home having a bath. Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I thought, oh, he's yeah. not there yet. I'll take my time. I should have said, I'm yeah. just bold your slippers. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, bruv. Thank you very much. If you're just watching this, you can follow up. Where can people follow your story? So, TikTok, Instagram, Kevin Lane, fitted up and fighting back. Uh, get on Twitter. Get on Twitter. Uh, Are you LinkedIn, on Twitter? No, LinkedIn, really. LinkedIn. I'm going to be doing my own podcast soon and interviewing people. There's going to be some good interviews coming up. And obviously the Lennox brothers with the film, they're on about me interviewing Tom Hardy, uh, Adele uh, and uh, David Beckham and people like that. Mm. So I'm going to stay away from the criminal side of it and go more professional. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're going to follow on Instagram and TikTok's the answer. Great, mate. If you're watching this, like it, share it. Uh, share our content. I have, I'm grateful to you. I enjoy these chats. We get to meet loads of different characters. I enjoy my work. You make that possible. So I'm very grateful for your support. Peace out and on to the next one, yeah? Thank you very much. Cheers. Okay. Carry on watching for more interesting guests. I'll talk to anyone. I'll debate anyone. I'll hear anyone's story. If you want to help me along that way, it's not free. I need your support. If you can support my family, that gives me my peace of mind. It means I can continue to do the work I do. You can do so at www.supporttommy.com. I appreciate every bit of support, as do my children. It gives me the ability to fly them out here to see me so I can stay in constant contact with them. I'm de-platform and I'm censored, so I need you. I need you to share this content. Make sure you stay tuned for upcoming weekly guests, interesting guests, exciting guests. I'm Tom Robson, and this has been my podcast, Silence.